It's a good morning. So good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, uh, or good evening, depending on time zone. Welcome to this the third session um, of the workshop on enabling quantum technologies and algorithm uh, for quantum computing, uh, sponsored by the Wallenberg Center for Quantum Technology. Uh, my name is Giulia Ferrini, and I'm one of the nine uh, principal investigators in VACT. Uh, and we're going to start the session with a talk by William Oliver, who is professor at MIT and also director of the Center for Quantum Engineering. And uh, so without further ado, please, Will, the stage is yours. Great, thank you very much. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me see. Uh, get set up. Uh, and one more. Okay, uh, Julia, how does that look? Very good. Very good. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. And it, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, what I'd like to talk about today is gate model quantum computing in general, and then we'll talk about it in the context of superconducting qubits, uh, an experiment from Google, as well as an experiment from our own group at MIT. Um, and, you know, feel free to, you know, interrupt, ask questions, maybe Julia can help uh, mo moderate that. Um, so, of course, with superconducting processors, we have nascent, you know, commercial versions that some of which are even accessible um, online. And we know of Google's uh, Sycamore chip, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, Rigetti, for example, uh, IBM, of course, has a lot of online quantum computers. Uh, this is a picture in the upper right is the backside of an Intel chip. And then also there are other types of quantum computers, not just gate model, but for example, quantum annealers from D-Wave. And of course, this picture in the middle is not a quantum computer. Um, you probably recognize this as the uh, Wright Flyer, which is the first uh, um, airplane. Um, and uh, you know, I think that the this this represents well the status of our field right now. Is that you know things are just getting off the ground um, and starting to work. Um, so of course, there's a lot of promise to quantum computing, but if we want to realize it, we need to engineer uh, systems that are robust, uh, reproducible. Uh, extensible. Um, and what we're going to focus on today are just the gate model type machines. There's many types, but we're just going to look at gate model. So with that, here's an outline of the talk. I'd like to first start with qubits in general and the gate model, have basically gates and how they work. Uh, we'll then just briefly talk about superconducting qubits, and uh, we'll introduce you know, Google's quantum supremacy algorithm. And then um, I'd like to talk about density matrix exponentiation. So, you know, just to warm up and to get into this, let's think about the similarities and differences between um, classical and quantum bits. So let's imagine we have three spins. Um, these could be electron spins in a magnetic field. Uh, there's a spin up state, uh, which we'll call the ground state, a spin down, which we'll call the excited state. And before they're even quantum mechanical, you can think of these as just classical uh, objects, right? And we know that if these are just classical bits, then we, and there are n of them, we have two to the n classical states we can represent, right? And we could put them in a state register like this, and you just enumerate all the different states, all of them being up uh, to all of those spins being down. And this gives you a, a notion of classical parallelism. And what I mean by that is classically, we take one of these states, we put it into a classical computer, we perform an operation and out comes some function of that and if we wanted to do a, a second computation on a different input state, we could either do it uh, sequentially in time on the same piece of hardware, or we could do it in parallel on multiple copies of the hardware. But either way, if you have an exponentially large number of states you want to go through, it takes either exponential time or exponential hardware. Okay. Now, quantum mechanically, the advantage, as you know, is that we can put these what I'll call now is aspects uh, into a large superposition state at the same time. So it's a single state, but it carries uh, aspects of all of these classical states simultaneously with weighting factors, uh, which are complex numbers. And so if you prefer, we can write it in terms of zeros and ones, 
which looks closer to classical digital electronics. Okay, so we're gonna change this to a quantum state register. We're gonna put these coefficients here, and this is now a quantum state register. And what I'd like to give now is just an intuitive look at what quantum parallelism and quantum interference uh, looks like. And, and this arises directly from having quantum superposition states and digital gates. So let's imagine now that we have these three atoms with a spin, electron spin. These are, this is a quantum system now. And we're going to apply a pulse, which has the right amplitude and duration to give us a pi rotation. Now, what we mean by that is on the block sphere, if the uh, qubit state is pointed towards the north pole, um, we're going to either rotate it to the south pole, or if it's at the south pole, it will rotate back up to the north pole. So spin up to spin down or spin down to spin up. We're just considering that. And we're only doing it on atom one. So what happens when you do this is you shuttle these coefficients in your state space. And the way to think about it is the state space before and after your pulse. So let's consider the case where you have spin up on this first atom and you apply this pulse. Well, what happens is, of course, it flips to down and those coefficients uh, will follow it and stay there. So where the C1 and C4 was associated with spin up, is C1 and C4 are now associated with spin down. You can also consider what happens to the uh, aspects where you are spin down. Uh, those will, of course, flip to spin up and their coefficients follow. So at the end of the day, it's interesting to note that I applied one pulse to one atom, but I was able to shuttle all of the coefficients between all of the aspects in my superposition state. And this is what we mean by quantum parallelism. Now, we can think about quantum interference in a similar context. And what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the amplitude by a factor two. The pulse is the same duration. We're going to apply it now to uh, atom number three. And this implements what's called a pi over two pulse, okay? And the way to think about this again is what happens before and after. And we have to take two cases now. So for those aspects where the spin is pointing up, I'm going to rotate by pi over two down to the, uh, this axis here, and I'm gonna associate that with a plus sign. So spin up becomes uh, up plus down. I'm not worried about normalization, okay? So we can look at this uh, spin up, for example, just one of them, and we know that it's going to go to up plus down. And so the coefficient C5 follows with a plus sign, right? Both, both a plus uh, with the spin up and a plus with the spin down. And again, I'm not worried about the one over square root of two here or, or whatever it is. Okay. Now, instead, if we had started in spin down at the south pole and we rotate in the same direction, we now realize we're pointed um, along this axis, but in the opposite direction. And so spin down goes to a combination of up minus down. And so this C6 coefficient will follow over to up and down, but it'll do so with this minus sign. And so what you can see is that if, for example, C5 equaled C6, it doesn't have to, but let's just imagine that it did, then the up, up, up state is going to double uh, its amplitude and the spin uh, down portion here is going to completely uh, destructively interfere to zero, okay? And so this is an example of quantum interference as looked at from a computational state space perspective. Now, it's also an example of quantum parallelism because this is happening on the entire state space at the same time. So again, one pulse applied to one qubit affects all of the components in a superposition state simultaneously and can create quantum interference. So the next step then is to ask, well, what do these gates you know, look like and how do you categorize them? And so to do that, let's take a step back for a moment and think about classical gates. So there's a handful of them that you're probably familiar with. Some of them are single bit gates like the not gate. And then some of them are two bit gates and there's a whole list of them here, but for example, and, or, uh, not and, not or, XOR, et cetera. And the truth tables are shown here. And I won't talk through them, but it shows how your input will change to the output under the influence of this gate. So these are Boolean logic gates that we use in our digital computers. And we know that, that a handful of these gates, not all of them, you don't need all of them, but a handful of them together will give you a 
universal set of gates that allows you to perform any arbitrary Boolean algorithm. So for example, the NOT gate and the AND gate, or of course you could combine it together and have NAND, um, NOR is another universal set. And depending on the problem, some universal sets may be more efficient in implementing an algorithm some, than some other ones. But if you have a universal set, you can reach any state in the state space from any starting point. That's what it means to be universal. And you can implement, therefore, any logic, uh, Boolean logic. So of course, quantum computers can do the same thing. And they do it using quantum gates, which I show here. And um, there are many single qubit gates, like the identity gate, uh, x, y, and z, which indicates which axis on the block sphere we rotate around. Um, and then some other ones, which are also along the z-axis, but for different uh, angles of rotation, such as s and t. And then, of course, the Hadamard gate, which is a combination of um, x and z, rotating around x and z axis. So um, again, you have truth tables, but now we use quantum states instead of the uh, Boolean logic states. Um, there's, of course, a handful of two qubit gates. Uh, we also call them entangling gates, uh, such as C0 and CZ um, and its truth table. And of course, as you know, we can form a universal set of gates from just a handful of these single qubit and two qubit gates. And here's just one example shown here. And again, it's not unique, but, but when you have a universal set of gates with that gate, you can perform any arbitrary quantum logic. Now, in fact, it's, it's interesting to note that with a universal set of quantum gates, you can also perform any arbitrary uh, Boolean logic, but often a quantum computer will new, do no better than a classical computer at Boolean logic, and often it will do much worse. But we know that for um, certain quantum algorithms, you know, a quantum computer will vastly outperform a classical computer. So let's take a look at some of these gates in a little more detail. And, and the one that we're going to look at first is an analog of the classical NOT gate, which takes an input and inverts it. So zero goes to one or one goes to zero. And, and the quantum analog to that is the X gate, which will take a quantum state zero uh, and take it to quantum state one or vice versa. So this is what it looks like on the block sphere. Um, the blue vector here is the block vector and it starts at the North Pole and it rotates to the south pole under the action of this vector that's uh, the red vector that's coming in and out of the screen along the x-axis. And, and that's representing the envelope of the pulse that we apply to the qubit to implement the gate. And the amplitude and the duration of the pulse is, is tuned so that you get exactly a pi pulse rotation. And we call it an x-gate because we're rotating around the x-axis. Now, in this case, the the you start at the North Pole, you end at the South Pole. So this is just a classical bit. It's implemented with a quantum computer, but there's nothing quantum mechanical yet. There's no superposition state. Um, and, and of course, it just inverts states 0 and 1. But of course, we know that we can apply this same gate, this same pulse, to any arbitrary starting position. For example, a superposition alpha 0 plus beta 1. And this gate will rotate that 180 degrees around the x-axis. And the action of this is to swap alpha and beta uh, of the superposition state. So alpha 0 plus beta 1 becomes beta 0 plus alpha 1. Okay, And that, that's what an X gate does. So that's an example of a single qubit operation. Now, for a two qubit operation, um, we're going to use as an analog the classical exclusive OR gate. Um, and that's shown here. And you have two input bits, x and y. and one of them we're going to call the control bit, and the other one we'll call the target bit. And here's your truth table for the inputs x and y, and here are the resulting outputs. And this, this, this symbol here means exclusive OR, and this is what happens at the output. We just carry the x through. Now, when your x or your control bit is in state 0, um, the output of your y is just copied onto the uh, exclusive OR output, meaning that y, nothing happens to y. It just gets passed out to the exclusive OR output. But when your control bit is 1, you basically perform an inversion operation. You 0 becomes 1, and 1 becomes 0. Okay, And that's how the exclusive OR works. Now, the quantum analog of that is called a CNOT gate, or quantum CNOT gate, controlled knot. And the truth table now has these quantum states, but you can see that the numbers are basically the same. We just have the, the cats now. And 
one of the qubits is called a control qubit, and the other is called a target qubit. And this is how we represent uh, C naught. So we perform an operation on qubit Y depending on the state of qubit X. That's what it, what it means. And so let's take as an example um, an input state, psi in, which is a superposition zero, uh, zero plus one of your control bit, and your target bit is just in its ground state zero. Okay, and of course we can take these one at a time. So um, if we look at the blue here, um, the control bit is in state zero, the target bit is in state zero. Um, we know that when the control bit is in zero, we don't do anything to the target, so it just comes down here as a zero. Okay, and you can see up here in the truth table, that's, what, that's what's indicated. And when you have state one for your control bit though, we know we're supposed to flip the target bit. And so now this flips to one. And this is quite interesting, right? Because although we started in a state which we could factorize into an X component cross a Y component, after this operation, we can no longer do that. Zero, zero plus one, one is an entangled state and it cannot be factorized into an X component tensor product a Y component. And so uh, this two qubit gate is also known as an entangling gate for this reason. So this is just an example of a single and a two qubit gate. And with these, again, you can combine different single and two qubit gates to form a universal gate model quantum uh, computation. Okay, so what does a quantum algorithm then look like at a high level? Okay, well, um, you have an input state um, and generally you'll prepare your qubits and your uh, computer in a uh, massive uh, equal superposition state. So 000 plus 001 plus 010, zero, et cetera, all the way down to 111. And of course, if you have n qubits, there would be two to the n such states, but they're in an equal superposition. And this gets fed into your computer and your algorithm prescribes uh, certain single and two qubit gates. And so let's say you have a single qubit operation on qubit three. And as we saw earlier, um, it's one operation applied to one qubit, but it affects um, all of the aspects in the superposition state, right? That's quantum parallelism. That's followed by quantum interference. And what that does is it changes the coefficients, the weighting of these different aspects in your superposition state, okay? Now, of course, we also have two qubit gates or coupled qubit gates as we call them. And as we said, you know, the control qubit state will determine what happens to the target qubit. Uh, that's followed by quantum interference. And this goes on and on according to some prescription of single and two qubit gates. And the goal is that by the end of the computation, that basically all of your probability amplitude resides in front of one of these aspects or nearly all of it. Um, and that's because we know that when we make a measurement, we're gonna get a massive collapse down to one state and the probability we get that state uh, goes as the magnitude squared of that coefficient. And so if one of those coefficients is one or close to one, then with very high probability, or in fact, unital probability, we will get this result. And, and this result encodes the answer to the question that we're trying uh, to solve uh, through our algorithm. And so, so a quantum algorithm designer's goal is to come up with these single and two qubit operations that allow this parallelism and quantum interference to end up in this type of uh, output where we can make a measurement and get an answer with high probability. So that's basically at a high level how it works. Now there are a number of digital algorithms and I'm not going to talk through all of them today, but I just wanna highlight a few of them or a few categories. Um, one of course, a very important is quantum simulation such as quantum chemistry. And what we show here is the classical time, which is basically exponential in the number of atoms you're trying to simulate. Um, and the quantum time, which brings that N out of the exponent into the prefactor um, and, and, and therefore there's an um, exponential improvement. Now, of course, we know Peter Shor's algorithm, a uh, factoring algorithm and related number theoretic algorithms similarly have exponential speed up on a quantum computer. Um, Aram Harrow and colleagues did linear um, solutions to, to linear equations uh, such as AX plus B. Um, optimization problems uh, are also a category, an important one and search, which is uh, Grover's uh, type algorithm. And of course, there's still a lot of research going on. We don't have all the answers to how to implement these yet, nor do we have a quantum computer that's large enough yet to really show quantum advantage uh, for, for these, but, but, but we will be there 
um, in the coming years. So when we want to implement these algorithms, then there's a couple ways that we can do it, basically two ways. Um, the long term goal is to build fault tolerant quantum computers, right? And, and what that means is that you, you build logical qubits out of physical qubits. Um, and, and what that means is physical qubits are the qubits we have in our lab, and they have some error rate, which isn't as good as we'd like it. But if it's good enough, if the individual qubits are good enough, then when we aggregate them together, we can, um, we can develop robustness through redundancy. So by adding more physical qubits together, we can actually end up with what we'll call a logical qubit that, that performs even better, provided the individual qubits are above some threshold in terms of their performance, right? If they weren't above that threshold, then adding more things together just gets worse. But if they're good enough, adding a lot of them together makes things get better. Um, and then of course, operations on single logical qubits, algorithms, and then when we've demonstrated this, we'll have a general fault tolerant uh, quantum computer. Now that, that's, that's in the future. We're working hard on that as a community. Today, what we can do is implement algorithms without quantum error correction. And, and this has been coined by John Preskill as the noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum or NISC uh, era, NISC quantum computers. And, and there we are you know, implementing the gates that we have with fast feedback, maybe playing with the connectivity, mitigating noise uh, passively, not active error correction, but passive error correction to, to implement the gates within the coherence times that our uh, qubits allow us, right? So that's where we're at today. So with that, let me now switch gears and talk a bit about a particular hardware platform, uh, superconducting qubits. Um, and superconducting qubits um, are electrical circuits uh, that we make from superconducting materials like aluminum. And it starts intuitively as simply a simple harmonic oscillator, um, an inductor and a capacitor. Uh, if you took an inductor and a capacitor, put them in parallel, you know, you have a resonant circuit and it resonates with the frequency omega C. And if you cool this down to a low enough temperature, it in fact will be a quantum harmonic oscillator. It has a parabolic potential shown here, uh, or harmonic potential as it's called. And then of course it will have discrete energy levels, which you can count as zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And these levels are separated in energy by H bar, Planck's constant uh, times uh, the resonant frequency. So this is a quantum circuit. Uh, but it's not a qubit yet because we can't uniquely identify the zero one transition. Uh, it's no different. In fact, it's degenerate with all of these other transitions. So we have to make something nonlinear in the circuit. And what we choose to use is called a Josephson junction, which is a Josephson or superconducting tunneling barrier, a uh, superconductor, let me say that again. It's a superconducting leads with an insulating tunneling barrier. And this, object is called a Josephson junction. Now the insulator is very thin, it's typically aluminum oxide. And um, what Brian Josephson showed us was these two uh, relationships, the current relation and the voltage relation. And for our purposes here, what we need to know is that when we combine them together in the usual way to define an inductance, that that inductance becomes nonlinear in the current that flows through this tunnel junction. So in a sense, uh, in a very real sense, it is a nonlinear inductor, nonlinear in the current that flows through it. And if we replace this linear inductor now with the Josephson junction, we have an anharmonic oscillator. Uh, in fact, this is a qubit called a fixed frequency transmon. And rather than the parabolic potential, it changes it to a cosine potential in blue. And one of the consequences of that is that these uh, energy level transitions are no longer degenerate. And that's really useful because we can now uniquely identify the zero one transition and call this our qubit. And this is no different than an, than an atomic system where you have, may have multiple energy levels, but you only look at one of those transitions uh, as your qubit because it's uniquely uh, definable in energy from the other transitions, okay. So, so this is just one example of a very large family of what you might call artificial atoms or quantum circuits that are built from this concept. And you may add inductors or capacitors and Josephson junctions uh, to, to come up with different properties. And that's what I'd like to show here. And um, what's around the outside here are different flavors of superconducting qubit. 
And we achieve them by adding different elements, like, uh, for example, more junctions, or we might take a junction and split it out into a loop. Uh, we might add a shunt capacitor, et cetera. And what this means is that we have a number of parameters that we can use as design parameters, such as the critical current of the small junction, the junction capacitance, shunt capacitance, et cetera. And with that, we can design the energy level separation between zero and one that we desire. And typically it's between three and six gigahertz. We can also determine how different the one, two transition is from the zero one transition. That's a property called anharmonicity. And we can also trade off the sensitivity to different types of noise based on how we design uh, these artificial atoms. Okay. So we control these artificial atoms either with a um, magnetic field or an electric field that is resonant with that zero one transition. And I'd like to just tie this back now to the gates that we're talking about. And to do that, we apply microwave pulses. Again, this would either be an electric field or an, a magnetic field at the qubit. And the way we generate this pulse is with an arbitrary waveform generator, which creates basically the envelope and maybe some low intermediate frequency. Uh, and we multiply that with a local oscillator frequency, which is close to zero one transition frequency. And we use what's called an IQ mixer. And an IQ mixer multiplies together uh, the envelope that's coming in either I or Q port with the local oscillator and outputs uh, that result. Now, if you use the I port, the phase doesn't change, right? We'll say that that's zero phase, and we're going to call that the X axis. If you instead elect to use the Q port, the quadrature port, then you get a 90 degree phase shift at your output, and we're going to associate that with the Y axis. So now here's our block sphere again, and we're rotating the block vector around according to the pulses that we apply. And, and that's indicated here on the right. Now, I apologize for the use of blue and red. Um, they're not correlated between the block sphere and what we're seeing over here. On the right, blue means in phase, which is the x-axis. And so you can see a rotation around the x-axis here. Now the minus x-axis will now go to the Q port, which is the y-axis. And with half the area, we only do a pi over two pulse, which brings us up to the equator, a superposition. And with another pulse, that brings us up to the North Pole again. So this is how we can achieve universal control. These are single qubits here, but this concept is how we can drive transitions and implement gates in a superconducting uh, processor. So of course, you could ask how well do we do those gates? And, and that would be a notion called gate fidelity. And um, if, if you go from say the North Pole to the South Pole, uh, the question is how close to the South Pole did you get, right? And if you got exactly there, you implemented a perfect gate, that would be a fidelity of one. We're sometimes called in percentage 100%. Um, and of course we aren't perfect. So we try to get as close to one as possible. And we can measure or benchmark these gates using something called randomized benchmarking. I won't get into how that works today, but that gives you a fidelity for the different types of pulses that one might apply to the qubit. And you can see here, um, these are measurements we've made in our lab. Um, and all of these gates are above three nines, as we say, or 99.9%. .9%. Now, similarly, you can measure the fidelity of two qubit gates, and that's very important. The two main ones being I swap and control Z. And as Young Q Sung will talk about in the next talk, um, we've achieved fidelities approaching almost 99.9% uh, with our two qubit fidelities. I would say generally it's above 99.5%. Okay. So let's now talk a little bit about quantum advantage. Um, so you saw this chip earlier. This is the Sycamore chip, which had 53 qubits and uh, tunable couplers in between. And maybe you're familiar with this experiment they did where they applied a random set of gates um, and they increased the number of qubits that they used to go from something which was classically verifiable um, eventually out to something which they couldn't verify in a reasonable amount of time on the world's most powerful computer, the top one, uh, the Summit, uh, Summit Classical Computer uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab. And um, so, so basically using 53 superconducting qubits, um, the Google AI team uh, was able to demonstrate a calculation. Uh, they generated a random number at the end of the day 
um, in about 200 seconds and maybe with about 50 kilowatts of power on, you know, on 53 qubits. Um, and it would have taken uh, the Summit supercomputer, which has more than uh, 10 to the 15 transistors, um, runs on about 10 megawatts of power, and it would have taken it anywhere from a few days um, to much longer, right? So clearly, uh, along many axes here, this, this is a demonstration of quantum advantage. Okay. Now, you could ask, and I'll, I'll talk in a minute about programming Sycamore. How do you do this, right? And you have what you see here are qubits in gray and these tunable couplers, which turn on and off the neighboring two qubit coupling. And so you can zoom in here and look at this um, uh, on the left. And so you have a, a, a qubit here, and then you have couplers A, B, C, and D. And this is what we're going to call quantum hardware. These are the physical qubits and tunable couplers that they use. And then, like a musical score, one applies gates to either the qubits, um, well, one applies gates to single qubit gates shown here. And then on the next step, they apply coupled uh, qubit operations. For example, that's on A. And then more single qubit gates. And then they couple together these qubits through tunable coupler B, uh, et cetera. And this runs along according to a prescription, which is an algorithm. And they, how many cycles they run, um, as they increase the number of cycles, it gets harder and harder for a classical computer to simulate the result. And eventually you get enough and you just can't do it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but if you look at this, this is all classical, right? You can write it down. Um, and as I just showed with an arbitrary waveform generator and a local oscillator, you can apply these gates. This is all classical. These instructions are classical and you apply it to the quantum hardware to implement quantum operations. Okay, and this is the conventional way that we implement quantum algorithms today. So with that, I'd like to um, talk about a different approach. Um, and it's in the context of something called density matrix exponentiation. So what you see here is a hand. This is uh, Barbara Liskov's hand. She's a famous computer scientist. And you know this is called a punch card. I don't know if you've seen them, uh, but, but they used to be used to um, input data into classical computers, right? Um, and these punches over here are the data. And these punches over here are the instructions. And what you can see is that the instructions in the data are represented in exactly the same way. And this is a property called homoiconicity. And what it means is that the code you run and the data you process are both basically the same. They're represented in the same, uh, in the same way and implemented on the same hardware. And so that's what classical computers are. And, and so we've talked about this before, but let's, let's just go through it again. You have an instruction, classical computing now, you have an instruction uh, set um, that you interpret or compile into a set of classical gates, which take an input, perform a function that you care about that's defined by this instruction set and give you some output. So here, the code and the data are clearly both classical, right? No, no surprise. Now, on a quantum computer, the way we usually think about it, whether it's a single qubit or multiple qubits, you have some classical instruction stored in your AWG somewhere, which we use to implement a particular gate, let's say pi over two along x. And then once we apply it, everything's classical at this point in gray. We then apply it to qubits to implement some unitary operation, in this case, a very simple one. And what comes out is uh, e to the minus i h t, where this Hamiltonian that we are implementing is determined by this classical gate. Now that's the single qubit gates. We can also do a multi-qubit case. And there again, you have your musical score. The unitary is more complicated, but at the end of the day, it's basically the same idea. You take some input state and you, you have this operator that applies to it. Okay, to get your output state. So here the code is classical, the data is quantum. Now the question is, are there any cases where we can have quantum code and quantum data, right? And um, what that would look like, and of course I'll just give it away that a density matrix exponentiation we believe is one way to do this. Um, if you have a single qubit, the idea is that you have your single um, qubit state and you operate on it based on the states of other qubits, right? Now, this is not 
um, simply a two cubic gate that I talked about before, because this other state can be completely arbitrary. All right. And what we do is something called trotterization, where we break up the time evolution into little pieces and we consume one of these instructions um, to give us a little bit, I'll talk about this in a moment, but to give a little bit of a rotation, then we consume another one to get a little more rotation, et cetera. And eventually you implement uh, this, this rotation that you see here. Okay, so, so how does this work? Um, basically, conceptually, this density matrix exponentiation allows us to load a program into a state, an instruction state, and execute that program on another state. So of course, the delta then and the number of steps that's chosen classically, but the operation we perform is completely uh, quantum mechanical. Okay, and that's that's a very different paradigm. Okay, and this was first proposed by Seth Lloyd back in 2014. So. Density matrix exponentiation is efficient um, because it, it, it gives an exponential reduction in the resource requirements over any tomographic strategy. If you have an unknown state in, a, in our conventional view of quantum computing and you want to do something based on that state, you first tomographically reconstruct it, then on a classical computer program your arbitrary waveform generator and then send down a new set of gates. But with quantum instructions, you don't have to do that. And there are a number of applications that I'll show here, and I won't talk through them because I'm running out of time. But the number of applications that you can use that take advantage um, potentially of these quantum instructions. So how it works is basically the following. You have a target state sigma, and you have a number of these um, instruction states, and you perform what's called an I swap, which is a small rotation um, to delta, and you rotate sigma basically around the state rho. They actually both rotate, but but um, and this this is you know similar to what you would call a swap gate if if this two delta equaled pi over two. Okay, but you keep doing this, and eventually, in small steps, you can implement the full angle that you wanted with some small trotterization or algorithmic error. Okay, so we did this experiment. And what we did is rather than using um, rather than using n copies of the instruction state, or rather than you, what we would do is reset the instruction state. You keep the same state, but then you just reset it. Now it turns that measurement and feedback was slow enough that we wanted to do something even faster, which is called quantum measurement emulation. And uh, Amy's going to talk about that later today. But with quantum uh, measurement emulation, we could basically approximately reset rho after each rotation. And that, of course, introduced a new error, but um, it allowed us to do this experiment. So let me just give one um, run through of what this looks like. If your um, input state is along y, and you want to run this density matrix exponentiation around a state x, now here we know what it is. But in principle, it could be arbitrary. That's what rho is. Um, we're going to do it in four steps, and we want to do a rotation of pi over two. And what this is equivalent to is doing a, an operation um, pi over two around x on this state y. So this is what it looks like. Um, again, you start in state y, and you're rotating around the uh, state rho, which is along x. And you can just follow along at each step you take a little step, you take a little step, you take a little step, okay? Now, the instruction state, again, was rho. Rho told us what axis we rotate around. Um, and it's the input to this density matrix exponentiation algorithm which gives you this rotation around x, okay? So the setting of the instruction qubit instructs which axis to rotate around. And here we know it because we're trying to make this demonstration. But in principle, it need not be a single qubit and of course, you in principle don't know it. It could be um, a very large and complicated multi-qubit state. We can do the same thing. Um, now, in this case, we start on the y-axis, but we rotate around the z-axis just to show that you can use a different axis around the equator. And we did this in eight steps to do a pi pulse. Okay. So this demonstration required high fidelity two-qubit gates, which Young is going to talk about next, and also quantum measurement emulation which Amy will talk about later today. Um, and so with that, 
um, we demonstrated this density matrix exponentiation algorithm using superconducting qubits. Um, and it, it leads to an interesting question whether we can approach something like homoiconicity in quantum computers. That's an unknown. And, and we don't know yet how to program these quantum instructions yet or take advantage of how to, you know, them once we can program them. Um, let me acknowledge all the folks who participated here um, on the uh, uh, DME experiment, as well as my uh, collaborators at Lincoln Lab and, and at MIT campus. Thank you. Thank you very much. I give you an applause uh, on behalf of all the other participants. Uh, other questions for Will? You can either place them in the chat or raise your virtual hand, or also unmute yourself and uh, ask your question directly. I do have questions, but I would like to give the opportunity to other participants first to ask their questions. Okay, I see one. Alejandro, please go ahead. Oh, let's see. So should Alejandro, I- Alejandro? Uh, oui. Yeah, so-, so Ah, Alejandro can't unmute uh, himself. Uh, okay. Uh, so let me first, I start by reading you a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, it says, out of the different Josephson junctions based on qubits, which one do you think is the most promising? In the meantime, uh, I will uh, uh, unmute uh, Alejandro. Yeah, so that's a great question. I think that it's not clear today. Um, I think the transmon has taken us quite far because it's a relatively simple qubit um, to, to make, but of course it has issues. And I think that the community is looking more and more at protected qubits um, to help, you know, maybe increase the coherence times and the fidelities. Uh, but, but what we're learning is that, um, you know, the, the, the noise in the environment uh, and the calibrations that need to happen in multi-qubit systems, you know, you need to balance this against one another. And, you know, you can, you can add sophistication to a circuit by adding more elements, but you also have to then think downstream, you know, if, if I have, if every qubit has a hundred junctions, then um, is that an extensible solution? Maybe it is, um, who knows? So I, I don't think it's quite known yet, but I think people are realizing that the transmon may be coming to the end um, of its life and its utility. It was a very, very good and important qubit, but I think that uh, we need to do something different um, in the next five or 10 years. Okay, I would like to give the opportunity to Alejandro to ask his question now. He was first to raise his hand. All right, can, can, you, can you hear me yes. properly there? Yes. I guess this is a very naive question, but this is my first time seeing like the density matrix exponentiation. So I was wondering, um, yeah, if you can, provide more intuition on how this might help us, I mean, this different paradigm compared to the gate model or the classical set of instructions, like why does this new paradigm can, in which way can improve our yeah, quantum algorithms? Yeah, thanks for the question. That's having some trouble here. Uh... Okay. Oliver, uh, you have been muted again. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, sorry about that. Zoom just quit on me, so. <laughs> um, let me share my screen one more time. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, Okay, so this, this should now be visible, yeah? Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay, good. So the idea is that, there we go. Jeez, I'm sorry, this is, uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so the idea is that if you have, um, if you wanna do a rotation of sigma, state sigma around some arbitrary state rho, where rho is the quantum instruction, Right, and so you can think about that. 
um, in the following way, like one example of why that might be beneficial. First of all, um, that could be a very complicated state. You're doing a, not just a one or a two qubit gate equivalent, but you're making an n qubit rotation, right? Um, by taking your qubit, say sigma, and rotating around some complicated state rho. And in fact, sigma could also be a multi qubit state. So it doesn't, um, it goes beyond just the decomposition into single and two qubit gates. The second thing that you could imagine is that you have some an algorithm, and some of these are listed here, where you've got to some point in the computation and the next step in your computation depends on the current state of your system. So in the conventional quantum computing uh, paradigm, you would have to do full state tomography on the current state of the system, right? And now I know what state it's in. Okay, depending on that state, um, I have to perform this operation. Right, But if it were a different state, I would perform a different operation. And the only way I know what to do next is if I tomographically reconstruct the current state. Right, But we know that's not efficient. But if, if instead we have a mechanism to implement a quantum instruction, right, which means we can do that rotation based on the current state of the system without knowing what it is, right, then we, we have basically implemented quantum instructions. We don't need to do the tomography and we don't have that uh, exponential slowdown, right? And so that's, that's the intuition and some of that uh, intuition or you know, applications of that intuition are in these uh, papers here. Did that, did that help yep. answer the question? Yep, thanks. Thanks very yep. much. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there are more participants with raised hands and questions, but unfortunately, I think we have to move on. So I would invite people who still have questions for Will to ask them uh, in the chat privately then to him if Will is still going to uh, stay in the meeting for a couple of extra minutes. Uh, I, otherwise, I would really like to invite uh, Yong Kyu Sung uh, from uh, also Massachusetts Institute of Technology to share his uh, screen, please. Okay. Um... Uh, so can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yep. Uh, hi. 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 My name, my name is uh, Yong Kyu Song. I'm a graduate student in William Oliver's group at MIT. Uh, today I'm going to talk about our recent work on two qubit gate using a tunable coupler. Okay. Uh, so let me first describe motivation of this work. Uh, as we said, uh, in order to like run useful quantum algorithms or quantum error correcting code, uh, we need high fidelity quantum gates. And in general, this requires no parasitic interaction between qubits, for example, always on CC. And as you know, one of the major challenges at this moment is an implementation of high fidelity to qubit gates. So uh, in order to satisfy this requirement, we use a tunable coupler. The idea of tunable coupler that we consider in this work is quite simple. Uh, you can just think of coupler as another qubit. And by tuning this coupler frequency, you can adjust the effective coupling strengths between qubit one and qubit two. So here is some uh, example simulation basically showing the tunability of this effective coupling strengths as function of the coupler frequency. And this allows us to switch off the parasitic interaction between qubit, which is good. So the next question is how can we implement high fidelity to qubit gate? So in this talk, I'm going to show how we push the fidelity uh, of two qubit gate, both control D and ISWAP gate by engineering the control and level structure of a tunable coupler. Uh, here is our device setup. We have three capacitively coupled transmon. Qubit one, coupler, and qubit two. Qubit one has a fixed frequency, coupler and qubit two have tunable frequencies. And we have both qubit and coupler have readout and control lines. Therefore, we could read out the state of qubit and coupler. So next, I'm going to show how we uh, use tunable coupler to make two qubit gates. So first, let me talk about how we make control Z gate using a tunable coupler. So here is four by four matrix representing a CZ gate. So our goal here is to let one one state to acquire pi phase shift. And this one one state corresponds to one zero one state in our notation. 
And let me describe the protocol. So first, we start with the coupling turned off, the coupling between qubits turned off. Then we bring 101 state in resonance with 200 state. In the bottom left figure, there is an energy level diagram showing the level crossing between these two states. And you can see that uh, by tuning the qubit to frequency, we can bring them on resonance. And next, we turn on the coupling strings by bringing down the coupler frequency. And you can notice that there are two changes. First, there is an overall downward level shift due to the level repulsion from higher coupler state. And there is an opening of the gap at the crossing, and this gap corresponds to the coupling strings between the two states. So once you turn on the coupling strings, these two states will start to oscillate or swap. And by letting them complete a single period of an oscillation, we can make 101 state to acquire pi phase shift. And here is a measurement data that's showing the, the oscillation between these two states as a function of the coupler frequency. And you can see that the frequency of the oscillation, which correspond to the coupling strings, uh, changes as a function of the coupler frequency. Therefore, we could adjust the length of control Z gate by tuning the coupler frequency. Uh, now, let me move on to an I swap gate. Uh, here is again four by four matrix representing an I swap gate. So our goal here is to swap one zero zero and zero zero one state with some additional phase shift. And uh, here is the protocol again. So first, with the coupling turned off, now we bring one zero zero and zero uh, in resonance with zero zero one state. And then we turn on the coupling strings by bringing down the coupler frequency. And here we let them complete half an oscillation such that the two states are fully swapped. And we measure this oscillation as function of the coupler frequency as before. And you can see that the frequency of the oscillation changes as function of the coupler frequency. Therefore, we could adjust the length of I swap gates by tuning the coupler frequency. Okay, so far I have described how can we make a CZ and I swap gate using a tunable coupler. And now let me describe how we could push the fidelity of these two qubit gates. So we know that qubit and coupler have finite coherence time. Therefore, in order to minimize the impact of the coherence error, we have to reduce the gate time. And this requires strong coupling strengths, which can be achieved by strong qubit coupler hybridization. For example, G over delta here, G is the coupling strength between qubit coupler, delta is the frequency detuning. So in our case, to implement 60 nanosecond CG and 30 nanosecond I swap, we had to reach a point where G over delta roughly one third. And at this point, the dispersive approximation doesn't hold anymore. And this could make a couple of problems. First, now the higher order terms become significant and this higher order interaction can make some additional coherent errors during two qubit gates. And second, since we are entering the known dispersive regime, without careful control, it can cause known adiabatic leakage into the coupler. So in this work, we engineer the control of multi-level coupler to suppress coherent leakage to the coupler and parasitic higher order interactions. So let me first describe how we optimize the control to suppress coherent leakage to the coupler. Uh, in order to implement leakage minimizing control, we introduce a simplified model of the leakage dynamics. So the first thing that we did is identifying leakage states that strongly interact with the computational state during the gate. In bottom left figure, we have identified leakage state when we perform CZ. So in both single and double excitation manifold, we could find this two two-level Hamiltonian describing the predominant or leading order leakage dynamics. And within our parameter regime, we find that these two Hamiltonians become equivalent up to some offset energies. Therefore, we have the single two-level Hamiltonian describing the leading order leakage dynamics. And such a mapping of the multi-level leakage dynamics onto a two-level system is quite useful because optimal control techniques are well studied for a two-level case. And in this work, we use the Slepian-based approach as shown in this paper to develop fast adiabatic control within this effective two-level system. To assess the performance of our optimized pulse shape, we compare it to a simple square pulse. In these 2D maps, we measure coherent leakage from 101 state to 011 state. This is the coupler excited state or the leakage state. 
So here we measure this coherent leakage from here to there as function of the number of CZ pulses and as function of the pulse amplitude for the coupler pulse, which correspond to this black uh, curve. So in the case of scalar pulse, since the coupler frequency goes down too fast, it causes landau zener type transition, which is basically non-adiabatic leakage into the coupler. And this is clearly captured in this periodic resonance or some coherent interference pattern. However, in the case of optimized pulse shape, since the coupler frequency goes down smoothly or in an adiabatic manner, so we could suppress uh, this leading order leakage into the coupler state or uh, the leakage state. And we also confirm that the other state in the throughput to manifold are negligible, like the leakage to other state are negligible, thereby uh, validating our leakage model. Uh, next, we measure the gate fidelity of the CZ gate by using the interleaf randomized benchmarking. So the CZ gate with the optimized pulse shape, we got almost 99.76% with 0.07% error bar. And for the scare pulse, we got 99.25% with 0.18% error bar. So we saw about 70% error reduction by using the optimized pulse shape. And we also simulate the T1 limit for a 60 nanosecond long CZ gate which is about 99.85%. And this was obtained by solving a Lindblad master equation. So this result shows that a well-engineered control pulse shape is essential to achieve high fidelities of fast uh, coupler mediated entangling gates. So now let me switch gears and talk about an eye swap gate. So when we perform an eye swap gate, we have to bring two transmon qubits in resonance. But if you use transmons, uh, there is always a problem. Uh, that is the parasitic cis interaction appears due to their weak on harmonicity or due to the second excited state of the transmon. So this cis interaction strength can be expressed by this following equation. Uh, this equation basically quantifies the conditional energy shift of qubit one depending on the qubit two state and vice versa. So if you take a closer look at the 101 state, uh, you can notice that the second excited state of qubit one and qubit two are quite closely located to 101 state. And the level repulsion between these states result in the positive CZ or some positive parasitic CZ interaction. And here's a numerical uh, simulation basically showing this parasitic CZ as function of the coupler frequency. You can see that as the coupling strength increases, this parasitic CZ uh, also become significant, which is a coherent error source for the eye swap gate. And in this work, what we have found that is this level repulsion or this parasitic CZ can be counteracted by having the second excited state of the coupler, which is zero to zero. And here is the experimental data and numerical simulation showing the suppression of this parasitic CZ by having the second excited state of the coupler. Okay, so when we perform an ISOAP gate, uh, we have to switch on and off the coupling strengths. So the coupler frequency trajectory should look like this. And this trajectory will change depending on the gate length. Therefore, the total ZZ accumulation of the ISOAP, which is this time integral of the zeta, where the ZZ uh, as function of time, will also change depending on the gate lengths. And we measure this uh, total CC accumulation per eye swap as function of the gate length in this top left figure. To measure this number precisely, we measure CC accumulation of multiple eye swap gates and fit the data with a linear curve to extract the CC per eye swap, which is here. And at the 30 nanosecond gate length, we find that the CC is almost canceled out, which we call the CC free eye swap gate. So just to make it clear, here we optimize both pulse shape and gate length. Pulse shape is for suppressing coherent leakage to the coupler, and gate length is to canceling out the residual ZZ interaction during the eye swap gate. And next, we measure the two qubit interaction fidelity of this ZZ free eye swap gate using interleaf randomized benchmarking. And here, when we interleaf eye swap gate, we also add some single qubit gate to correct the Z rotations of the eye swap. And the error contribution of this additional single qubit gate is about 0.015%. And we take this into account to extract the two qubit interaction fidelity of the eye swap, which is about 9.87 uh, with 0.23% error bar. And this is quite high due to the CZ cancellation and short gate lengths. But we also noticed that there is a large uncertainty, which is about two times error rate. 
And this is mainly due to the relative low single QBK fidelity, which makes it worse the reference Clifford error rate. So in the future work, we are planning to improve uh, single QBK fidelity by using virtual Z. And we actually noticed that uh, the recent Google work, uh, they used the virtual Z for the ISO update. And we are also planning to use iterate randomized benchmarking to better uh, to make better precision for the ISO update fidelity measurement. And also we want to distinguish some coherent error contribution versus systematic coherent error. Uh, so overall, uh, the key message here is that a well-engineered control for a multi-level coupler can reduce a residual ZZ error of the ISO update, thereby achieving high fidelity. And finally, I want to talk about why we chose small coupler and harmonicity as a part of engineering the coupler level structure. Uh, as I said before, the parasitic ZZ interaction is counteracted by the second excited state of the coupler. So as this zero to zero state gets closer to one zero one state, this counteractive force or interaction gets stronger. And this uh, effect is captured by this numerical simulation. Here we simulate the ZZ strength as function of the coupler on harmonicity and coupler frequency. And you can note it, and here we draw the red dashed curve where the ZZ is canceled out or like ZZ free uh, regime. So you can notice that as the, the magnitude of one harmonicity decreases, uh, this uh, dz free point or the coupler frequency where dz is canceled out also decreases. And this makes sense because with smaller coupler on harmonicity, like then we need to push more, push down more coupler frequency to use this zero to zero state uh, as a counteractive uh, interaction or cancel it to cancel out the, the parasitic dz due to the, the second excited state of the transform qubit. And uh, one another thing that we consider is that the swap interaction strength itself is mediated by what, 0, 1, 0, uh, which means that the contribution of the second excited state of the coupler is negligible. So here's a numerical simulation that shows this I swap interaction strength as function of the coupler on harmonicity and coupler frequency. And you can notice that the change in harmonicity doesn't coupler on harmonicity doesn't affect the swap interaction strengths. So these two observations draws the conclusion that uh, having a small coupler on harmonicity enables that uh, like ZZ cancellation at the lower coupler frequency, which have stronger I swap. Therefore, we can make a faster ZZ free I swap gate by having this small coupler on harmonicity. Okay, so now let me conclude. So in this work, we have developed tunable coupler scheme for CZ and I swap gates. Uh, we optimize control by going beyond the dispersive approximation to suppress coherent leakage and cancel out the parasitic CZ interaction. And we achieve high fidelity CZ and I swap gate by using this optimized control uh, by, to suppress leakage and cancel out the parasitic uh, CZ interaction. And finally, also I wanna talk about what's the next step. Um, for this uh, tunable coupler project. So uh, we are planning to test some two by two qubit array with four couplers. So it's a scaled version of this device. And we are hoping to uh, develop some calibration techniques to address correlated error in multi qubit coupler system. And specifically, we are looking at some spectator qubit effect in multi qubit devices. Okay, thank you for listening to the talk. And I'd like to thank our team members at MIT campus team and also MIT Lincoln Lab. And yeah, it was great pleasure giving the talk. And thank you for the, the FICA. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. OK, are there questions? You are receiving a lot of virtual applause, I see, in the, in the chat. Let's okay. see. Uh, so we have, we have time for one, uh, one question, maybe. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, there are already two in the chat. Let's see. Uh, the first is uh, Peter, Peter Spring. Hi, great. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, thanks for the great talk. So my question okay. is, um, do you know how much your coherence limit is coming from the, the coherence of the coupler qubit compared to the to the qubits involved in, in the gate? Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. So I guess uh, what's the uh, error contribution of some decoherence in the coupler, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yes. 
So uh, first, uh, like coupler, we have roughly 10 microsecond T1. And OK, so but T2 is quite low because we bias at the sensitive point. And T2 echo is about 5 microseconds. So this is quite low coherence time compared to qubit, so 60 microsecond and 30 microsecond T1, like qubit 1 and qubit 2. But uh, in simulation, we find that actually the coupler, like some contribution of the coupler decoherence is negligible compared to qubit 1 and qubit 2, even though coupler has like 10 microsecond T1. I don't remember the exact number, but uh, it's about um, yeah, five times smaller or 10 times smaller than like uh, decoherence adder due to the qubit uh, T1 relaxation, for example. And we find that uh, like uh, dephasing, like for example, T2 star, uh, like that doesn't affect much because that's uh, limited by one of F noise. And that noise is not actually limiting the gate adder since our gate is much faster than the co correlation time of the noise, the flux noise. Um, Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So we may, maybe can also take the question from Kiming Chang. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So I have a very general question. So I see you mentioned something about the ZZ free gate. So my question is that, can you give me some hint? So what is the advantage and disadvantage of this ZZ free strategy compared with using refocusing pulses? Refocusing pulses? Yeah. Uh, ah, you mean is, some... Yeah, I in see. NMR, this is very popular. And ZZ coupling uh -huh. is always there. and. Then, I, I think no one thinks it, it's a problem, but it seems like the ZZ free uh, strategy is not very popular. Can you uh -huh, give me uh -huh. some hint? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, so what I imagine is that, so if you have a ZZ cancellation, I think in the NMR, you can also do refocusing, but I know like some other folks, for example, in Google, they apply additional C phase gate to correct uh, the some additional ZZ due to the eye swap. And this uh, inevitably increased the circuit depth and which is not good for running NISC algorithm in general. So in that sense, we think this is if the eye swap gate would be beneficial uh, to make or some like to run some quantum algorithm with a short circuit depth or shallower circuit depth because it doesn't require some uh, correction due uh, having uh, additional C phase or some error mitigation. So we don't have to do that. So that's what we think that's the, the benefit of having this CC cancellation. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much again. Um, and you. we shall now move, uh, move forward. So uh, now it's the turn of uh, Christopher Warren from Chalmers. Um, so I would like to invite Chris to share his screen. Okay, how is that? Can everybody see? Yes, we see you. You can start. Great. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Warren. I'm a PhD student here at Chalmers University, uh, and I'm mostly focusing on the qubit control of multi-qubit architectures. So I was asked to give kind of a uh, brief overview of our developments here at Chalmers uh, in terms of our architecture. So I wanted to give a talk a little bit on uh, benchmarking uh, the success of scaling, I guess is my title. So. I generally like to start my talks with the punchline. So this is our latest multi-qubit device that we've developed here at Chalmers. It's a five qubit device where we have fixed frequency qubits here uh, circled in the white. And then each of these are coupled with these tunable couplers, which are also uh, essentially qubits, but we act with them in a high EJ over EC regime. So we have some preliminary results on this device that I'll share later, but first, I wanna talk a little bit more philosophy, I guess. When we're talking about benchmarking, typically we're talking about this from the algorithmic point of view. What kind of fidelity can we achieve in our gates? Can we do some kind of algorithm? But benchmarking is a lot more broad than that from a hardware perspective. Every single change you make in your fabrication, in your device, in your design, in your fridge instrumentation, all of that comes into uh, benchmarking. And are you doing better than your previous device? So to get to here, we have to figure out first where we started from. So starting small, our first generation device was essentially the same architecture. We had two fixed frequency qubits, qubit one and qubit two, and we had some tunable coupler in between. 
our fixed frequency qubits perform very well generally. We get consistently above um, 60 microseconds uh, T1, and we're not quite T1 limited in terms of our T2, but we're getting there and we can improve that with more filtering. And what we, when we were choosing our architecture with this kind of uh, design, what we had in mind is that all of our data should be on the thing that is the most coherent part of our system, which is our fixed frequency qubits. We don't need our coupler to have extraordinarily high coherence because its only job is to mediate the interaction between the qubits. And so through the operation, it should remain in the ground state. And the other thing is when we're thinking about scaling up, we have to think about all the control lines that are going into our device. So when we're going up to 10, 100, 1,000 qubits, we also have to think about how many lines are going to our fridge, how much power we're dissipating, and how we can actually start routing things. So the nice uh, thing about this kind of architecture that we're looking at is that every element has a single control line, whereas if you think about gridding out, say, tunable qubits um, and tunable couplers, and as well as needing the RF lines for them, the number of lines is much more burdensome than what we have uh, with our system. So what kind of interaction do we have with this? Well, it's a very similar system to the previous talk that we saw, but we uh, operate it in a very different way. So in general, there's only two ways to have a system to interact, that is to bring two things into resonance or to supply the energy difference between different levels. So the previous talk was the first of these where you brought uh, two levels into resonance and you get the natural interaction rate. Whereas what we uh, perform is we parametrically pump the difference frequency between the different levels. And this gives us access to a whole host of different gates. So by modulating the squid uh, at the frequency difference between these gates, we're essentially uh, creating an interaction between uh, these other levels. So we can implement say the I swap frequency or the I swap gate or the control Z operation. And these have been demonstrated originally uh, in the uh, McKay paper from IBM and then by Regetti as well uh, for the control Z operation. Now, what they missed, I guess, in the first uh, paper was that when you consider the higher levels of the transmon, you actually have access to other operations you can do. So when we're thinking about operating the control Z operation, which we've primarily focused on, what we're actually driving is we're driving from the one one state to the zero two state and over a round trip of that oscillation, we acquire a pi phase shift on the one one qubit. Now, this gives us a degree of selectivity over what we implement and essentially the strength of this pulse is given by the um, derivative of the coupler's frequency, or at least what bias point that we're operating at, as well as some other terms that correspond to the amplitude of that drive. So we can see this here on the lower right, some of the typical chevrons that we see of these kinds of swapping interactions. Where starting in the one one state, we can see this correspondingly also in the zero two landscape if we tune up the readout for that, where we uh, populate directly up into the zero two, and then we come back down. And then our gate time is where we've uh, found out that we can maximally swap our population. So it has a very simple tune up scheme. We don't have to worry about kind of the DC transients or anything that you might have to calibrate for when you're looking at implementing a DC gate, since we're uh, driving this with just an AC pulse as we typically do. And doing so we uh, can achieve a CZ gate fidelity of around 98.8%. So that's fine, but where are our errors actually lying? Well, we can do purity benchmarking as well, which is essentially we do tomography of our randomized benchmarking sequence to instead see where we lie on the block sphere rather than comparing or have we reached back to zero, zero. And we reveal that most of our errors are coming from incoherent mechanisms. So these are things like T1, uh, T2, et cetera. And that's not so surprising because unfortunately, one of the drawbacks of doing this parametric process is our gate time is maybe rather long. So it's around 300 nanoseconds, whereas if you compare it to some of the DC gates, you can get down onto the tens of nanosecond scale. But this is simply a design choice. We were somewhat conservative about the uh, first gate that we wanted to implement. So we kept our couplings between the coupler and the qubit low, which means that our effective interaction between our two qubits was also rather low. Our latest generation has essentially doubled the coupling between them. So we expect that we should be able to pull down our gate time by around half. Now, it's one thing to just be able to implement a gate or whatever else, but the parametric gate presents some interesting challenges from even a theoretical point of view. So we're starting to build a strong predictive model of how our gate actually works, because we can no longer kind of use the same simulation tricks that you might be able to have in the DC regime or in some other uh, kind of regimes. And 
the main reason why this parametric gate prevents, uh, presents so many computational difficulties is the parameter space is very large. We have this biasing point, which can sweep over an entire flux quantum. We have the drive strengths. We have the, um, say, phase of the pulses, as well as the gate length to try to optimize over. And some of these parameters are extraordinarily sensitive when we think about the errors that are coming about. So uh, when we're, say, picking our bias point, we have to trade that off against introducing more ZZ errors because we're dragging our, pair, our coupler closer in frequency to our qubits. And the other part problem that we see is since we're driving a squid, it's a nonlinear device. So we're going to start getting intermodulation products uh, to occur whenever we drive uh, this modulation through the squid. So that still has not stopped us from finding a correspondence between theory and experiment. On the right, I present to you again, some of these um, population um, transfers between say the zero two and the one one state. And I pose it to you as a question of which one was theory and which one was experiment. Well, the top graph is actually the theory. And we later found that uh, we saw this spurious peak occurring in the theory first, and then we verified that it actually exists in the experiment. So we're seeing a nice correspondence between what we're actually implementing and what we're theoretically understanding, which is very helpful when we're thinking about scaling this up and building out a lar larger architecture with this. So now that we know the theory, now that we know we can do a good gate, what can we do with it? Well, last year we implemented something called uh, the exact cover problem and we use QAOA to be able to solve it. Essentially, you have some conditions and you're trying to find a uh, solution which covers all of those conditions. It's uh, very related to um, something called the tail assignment problem that uh, our collaborator Pontus um, published last year as well, along with us. So we've demonstrated these high fidelity gates and single qubit control. And one of the nice things is, um, rather than just getting fidelity, which doesn't necessarily tell you the whole story when you're doing randomized benchmarking, we actually now have a very structured algorithm. And structure is very nice because that's eventually what we want to implement when we're actually running some algorithm on our hardware. And so we were the first ones to demonstrate uh, an experimental improvement of the QAOA algorithm by starting to increase the depth. So we were just lucky enough that our gates were good enough that as we increase the depth of running the algorithm, one of the things about these variational algorithms is as you increase uh, the depth of them, you should be able to have a higher success probability. Due to our gates, we were actually able to achieve this for the first time. And then this was later improved upon by uh, the ETH group where they actually did something that was more hardware efficient. They ne didn't necessarily care what their two qubit interaction was. They allowed the variational parameters to kind of compensate for that. Okay. So now we can get to here. Now this is our most recent device that we're working with. Let's uh, start talking about uh, our kind of methodology on how we're scaling up. So to focus on scaling using these fixed frequency qubits and tunable couplers, and several key technologies are allowing us to scale to this point. Primarily our AirBridge technology has developed where we can actually start integrating them on our chips. Uh, in our case, we actually are starting to use uh, these air bridges for uh, routing, for crossovers of our different uh, control lines, as well as we're using uh, these air bridges to be uh, acting as crossovers to provide galvanic contact between different elements so we can save on footprint. So over on the lower right here, we have our qubit that we're coupling to, and then we have, say, on the right, our resonator readout, and on the left, our coupler, and each of these are galvanically connected through uh, one of these air bridges. And so that saves on footprint because we can still get a very strong coupling without having to have a very large geometry and as well keep an isolated ground plane around our qubit, which we have seen is uh, very important when we're thinking about uh, the coherence of our devices. One of the other things that we've been working on and we have some preliminary results for, but I won't talk about here today, is our 3D integration work, which uh, we will integrate more in our scaling up towards the end of the year, as well as our software stack for control, because as we're building up larger and larger devices, it's gonna be impossible to start um, uh, kind of building um, and uh, controlling all of this. So we've maintained our single qubit control. We have uh, maintained some high T1s and we're still getting good gate fidelities out of this. And more importantly, we're starting to see that our DC crosstalk is actually very small. So since we don't have readout on the couplers, we have to use some different techniques to be able to do that. So we use our avoided level crossings and measure the flux quanta on a spectator coupler, let's say the minus flux quanta, the zero, and the plus flux quanta. 
And so at these points, we're insensitive to back action if we have a very small mutual inductance between devices and minimal shifting effects on other qubits that we might want to start tuning up. And we've seen that we, with our architecture and our air bridges and everything else, we can get down to around 0.6% of crosstalk. So just to summarize, we're rapidly moving ahead with our plans for scaling our devices. We will have a working 20 qubit chip by the end of the year, integrating all of our technologies. And combining all of the technologies, we do not yet see a critical path failure in terms of scaling up our devices. But we can keep this in mind that others have switched their technologies before to great success, Google being one of them. And we shouldn't be afraid that if we see some limitations in our hardware, that we can uh, switch because there's so many transferable uh, skills between technologies. And our close collaboration between theory and experiment here at WACT has been instrumental in exploring the limitations of our device. So with that, I'd like to thank, first of all, you for your time uh, for listening to me speak about this, as well as uh, all of the team here on the experimental side of things and our collaborators over on the theory side of things. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, let's see if there are questions for you in the chat or in uh, the participant list. Um, let's see if there are, while people uh, start raising their hand, okay, there is one raised hand. So let's give the priority to the participants. Um, so we have a question uh, from in Ingrid. Ingrid, go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, Chris, nice talk. Uh, I'm wondering, okay, so you're doubling the coupling strength to decrease the gate time. Can there be any negative effects from that? Yes, so one of the things that I talked about with this is this uh, ZZ interaction, which is um, it comes into effect when you actually have these couplings between the qubit and the coupler. You get some second order effects due to the uh, second excited state where your ZZ um, correspondingly increases as well. But we have some techniques that we're borrowing essentially also from the MIT group and some recent work from Rigetti um, where they look at floating couplers to try to find uh, design parameters which allow us to have uh, again a ZZ free interaction or at least a sweet spot that we can bias to where we are free of this ZZ interaction. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I have a super short question. You showed a plot with a comparison between uh, theory and experiment when it was about the uh, population transfer for yes. this decade. So why is it the theory more noisy than the experiment almost? Or... Uh -huh. I think this was just uh, the sampling that we uh, Jorge chose to do uh, in the theory. He could have okay. gotten a lot more, but um, the noise that you see is really just a uh, small sampling. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, with this, uh, thanks again, Chris. Um, let's move forward. And uh, we now have a talk by GLU, whom I would like to invite to share the screen. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Thanks. Uh, thank you the, for the invitation and um, Roger. I'm, from the advanced quantum test bed at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And today I will talk about uh, our new qubit architecture, uh, our new processor architecture so that has a dynamically reconfigurable connectivity graph as, as can be defined by software after fabrication. And uh, so let me first talk that uh, all the quantum algorithms and the simulations depend critically on high quantity two qubit case. And uh, however, the superconducting flat platforms cannot uh, provide that uh, high quantity two qubit gates between distant qubit pairs due to their finite connectivity. This is highlighted in this uh, experiment. And on the other hand, other platforms that are not superconducting uh, that has uh, audio connectivity has demonstrated to be very powerful and promising architectures for near-term quantum simulations. Uh, this particular example shown here that has seven qubits implemented in an ion trap device that uh, possesses audio connectivity graph. And they were successful in carrying out uh, the beautiful simulation of information scrambling process in a black hole using the quantum circuit on the right hand side from Chris Monroe's group. At the same time, uh, if you want to use the uh, superconducting platforms and uh, use this finite connectivity on that platform, you, can, you have to use the Q-trees, which you basically allow, basically you have to change the computational basis from qubits to Q-trees. And you correspondingly have to modify your quantum circuit in a great way. And uh, this work is done in our group. 
And uh, so for the purpose of this talk, I will focus on the technological path of uh, increasing the connectivity on superconducting platforms. And uh, also at the same time, maintain a great controllability of the qubits and the connectivity graph. It's well known in our community that if we were to couple two transmon qubits that are not, not that physically far apart, you want to couple both of them to a common linear resonator as shown here. And uh, for the simplicity of this modeling, I will just uh, represent the two qubits as uh, poly operators. And uh, here I'm highlighting the fact that uh, I'm, I'm using a time dependent, uh, actually periodically remodulated uh, coupling terms for the qubit between qubit and the trend under the common linear resonator, which we call bus. Uh, the periodicity is characterized by this uh, frequency omega. Okay, seems like I'm stuck. Okay, um, so if you carry out the corresponding channel of transformation you, to eliminate the degree of freedom from the bus resonator, you can actually obtain this effective uh, photon swap Hamiltonian between the desired qubit pairs. Uh, this could be one, two, as you can see. And, uh, but this is under the assumption or the requirement that uh, the modulation period or frequency of the couplings matches half of the detuning between the two qubits. So as the last speaker mentioned, uh, this is actually, actually all the speakers uh, before me is actually a part of uh, the parametric modulation scheme. Uh, it's important to us to engineer a flexible and reconfigurable quantum processor because it basically means that you can use the spectral selectivity to address, to, in, to enable uh, a photon swap process that's happening in your pro quantum processor by just modulating the common uh, coupling element. As you will say that's, uh, if you have n transmon qubits coupled to one linear resonator and uh, you have one tuning element such that it enables you to tune the coupling of all the red qubits to this bus, as a bus resonator with the same, in the same way, then if you modulate the frequency, modulate the coupling at a certain frequency, you can actually address the desired qubit, qubit transitions you want like before. To give you a concrete example, consider the first three qubits in the system. Uh, if you are to provide them with this common coupling to the bus resonator uh, with this form, and uh, you modulate the coupling at uh, these three different frequencies that corresponds to the detune, half of detuning between the desired qubit pairs. With the transformation arrive at this effective Hamiltonian, you can see that this is like a nice one-to-one -one mapping from spectral content of your coupling elements to the, to the correspond okay. to the corresponding interaction Hamiltonian. And okay. you can dynamically. And please, all your... the other participants, sorry for the interruption. Can please all the other participants mute themselves temporarily until we have the question? Thank you. You can continue, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, where was it? Oh, so, yeah. So, the, you can see that it's a very nice, nice mapping from frequency spectral content, content of the coupling to the corresponding photon swap path between the desired qubit pairs. And uh, how we implemented this in experiment, we utilized a uh, long transmission line resonator as shown here as, ca as capacity of the couple to a transmon qubit. The tunability is introduced by introducing these two squid loops attached to the ends of the long end line resonator. The squid loops are very good the tunable inductors that allows you to use the external magnetic flux to change its uh, effective uh, inductance. And uh, this is plotting against uh, three different uh, squid asymmetries uh, as a function of external magnetic flux for the uh, effective inductance. It's basically translated to the tunable impedance for the squid loop. And uh, it's important because if you draw also the impedance of the transmission line, you can see that uh, for certain uh, mag external magnetic flux, you can have a squid impedance much smaller than the transmission line. And uh, you, uh, for other, you can get a much bigger uh, impedance than the transmission line. There's two types of uh, uh, primary choice or external magnetic flux choice, basically correspond to effectively open and short boundary condition uh, for the trans long transmission line resonator. And this is actually physically important in a way that uh, there's two types of boundary condition allows you geometrically to, or change the resonance mode profiles that can exist uh, inside of the uh, bus resonator. Because remember that so we are mediating the coupling between uh, different qubit pairs using a resonance mode of the resonator bus. And here I'm plotting one example 
uh, schematically, it's just showing, showing you the uh, resonance mode, the electrical field mode profile along the length of the transmission line resonator. You can see that uh, for open boundary condition, uh, you get you follow the green line, and for the shorter one, you follow the purple line. Um, these are just like electrical fields along the length of the transmission line resonator. It's very simple, and if you overlay the qubit positions on top of it, which is represented by this grid dash line, you can see that the qubits are corresponding to these two types of boundary conditions or external magnetic flux for this boundary squids. You can get the either maximum electric field amplitudes or the minimum electric field amplitude. It's a kind of geometric way of tuning the, tuning the interaction between the qubit and this particular resonance mode. So uh, with this observation, that's also that the qubit bus mode coupling is proportional to the electric field at the qubit position, geometric position. Um, you can basically, by changing the boundary condition to change the coupling between the qubit and the electric and then desired the resonance bus, as a resonance bus mode that mediates your couplings. And uh, if we do that, basically periodically in a time domain way, by adjusting the flux for the boundary squid loops, you can actually, as the animation shows, change the, uh, the coupling that I'm, uh, in periodically between the qubit and this resonance mode. And this actually is a critical ingredient that allows you to use one coupling, coupling element and one time-dependent coupling form to, to basically spectrally select the desired qubit-qubit uh, photon swap path or effective for Hamiltonians in your system. And uh, so let's put it together. If you were to engineer the desired qubit uh, qubit uh, hopping topology, you in your quantum processor, you first pack your cube, uh, bias your uh, square loops uh, attached to the uh, bus resonator, such that it possess, such that the qubit uh, location corresponds to the voltage nodes of the square of the bus bus mode that mediates the coupling. And then you basically turn on the uh, boundary flux modulations periodically, I mean, modulation such that the frequency matches the half of detuning between the desired qubit pairs, then induce qubit qubit photon swap uh, interaction Hamiltonian as before, as shown before. And the last, uh, if you are to, uh, if your experiment requires certain topology of the uh, qubit qubit effective interaction Hamiltonian, you can actually engineer that by simply multiplexing the frequency in frequency of the desired frequency components that corresponds to this uh, qubit pairs detuning half. So that's how you can, how you can reconfigure the connective graph afterwards. Uh, seems to, oh, okay. So we also incorporated the 3D integration architecture to allow us to basically imp, uh, maintain the high, co high controllability of a transmon qubits and incorporate this dense, actually bulky, coupling elements and all the control wirings associated with it, as you can see here. So all the elements are located on a, on a silicon chip called a, a cube, uh, called a wiring chip. And uh, the qubit chip is separately fabricated uh, on another silicon chip. And uh, it's a fully chip bounded onto the wiring chip. And the qubit chip, as name suggests, contains a qubit with a resonator and other wirings. Uh, and the transmission and is to probe the without resonator. And the qubit is basically a tra tunable transform qubit between 5 and 5.7 gigahertz. And uh, zooming onto the coupling uh, resonator uh, region in the green, you can see that it contains uh, two square loops at the boundaries of it. And uh, these are tuning, no two tuning knobs, tuning pads, allowing to uh, control the current of to use to uh, control external magnetic flux for these two square loops. And there's also a bus drive line in the middle that's uh, basically allows us to uh, continue uh, to drive with the bus resonance mode of interest. Um, so after obtaining our first uh, uh, batch of device, we start to calibrate the tuning curve for the bus resonator. This is a new device, we haven't ever done it before. So we just uh, inject the continuous wave to the bus drive line uh, and uh, got the uh, Norentian for the population in the bus resonance mode. Of interest. Uh, because the bus is coupled to the qubit, the qubit gets fractionally occupied by the large bus uh, photon population. And this fractional uh, occupation can be very sensitively measured by this dispersive readout scheme by using a readout resonator attached to the qubit. And the dispersive readout, uh, for people who are not familiar with this, basically, we allow, basically uh, captured by this Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian for the uh, readout resonator. It basically says that the frequency of the radar resonator depends on the 
number of photons in the qubit, right? So it was you fraction you occupy the qubit, your frequency shift, and then by measuring the shift or corresponding to the shift, you can basically sensitively determine how much photon is in the qubit and how much photon is in the in the in the uh, interest in the driven bus mode. So we did that experiment and use as a, use a qubit and the radar version as a very sensitive probe, allow us to probe the spectral response over the bus. And uh, by tuning the current from our first square loops, you can actually obtain the, this, I mean, the ideal or desired periodic tuning, frequency tuning over the bus. And similarly, you can see, uh, uh, tune the second square and get the same thing. And for this uh, two high order modes that exist inside of the bus resonator. Uh, if you are to decouple the qubit from the bus, as you mentioned, the first thing you want to do for, in, for generating parametric coupling is to detune the qubit from the bus. So it kills the DC qubit bus coupling to begin with. And uh, we do that bit by, we found this decoupling point by basically repeating the previous experiment. Drive, but at this time we want to find the point where the coupling is zero corresponding to the zero radar resonance frequency shift. Uh, we drive the bus continuously around the desired bus mode. Uh, observe the qubit, then you get this plot where it shows uh, basically a, a zooming version of the previous uh, measurement. But uh, this time you have as a qubit line near the tuning bus resonance line because we want to make the switch actually see both of the elements in one scan, in spectral scan. And uh, you can see that the qubit line is horizontal, it's not tuned by the, uh, it's not apparently tuned by the, the bias to the bus square loops. But there's a region where the qubit uh, response to the bus uh, uh, photon population decays actually to almost zero uh, around this region. And you can see that uh, this is exactly the decoupling point where we're talking about. The qubit now is located at the voltage node of the bus resonance mode. Uh, I mean, this is a 2D optimization problem because you have two square loops, right? And uh, then you can actually basically uh, from the other points where the qubit is decoupled from the bus, uh, what's the function of the two square loops uh, current bias. You drive uh, the bus at the qubit frequency and observe the qubit. Then you can see obtain this uh, 2D plot where the red region indicates the qubit bus decoupling point. And uh, so you can park your bus at those DC bias points and uh, carry out a standard two qubit, qubit tutor measurement and uh, uh, modulate uh, on top of the DC bias, modulate the uh, the bus external magnetic flux uh, uh, around the qubit bus uh, uh, detuning frequency. Because the qubit bus coupling is a linear type. So this is a showing here with this Hamiltonian. And uh, you can generate this desired wire crossing uh, in this plot and uh, the slope as one. Why the slope of one is important is because this is a linear type for a parametric coupling. So the slope is one, but for the qubit qubit slope is, it should be two. And uh, you can move, change the qubit frequency, actually obtain this, uh, move this away crossing linearly also. And uh, to see the particular qubit interaction, you carry out the same experiment as before, um, basically bias the, the bus to a proper point. In, on top of it, inject the AC modulation for the external magnetic flux. And then you get this uh, plot. And uh, you can notice that uh, um, this is of course a dominant uh, major avoided crossing with slope around the one. It's corresponding to seven qubits to the bus resonator uh, hyper parametric hybridization. The other two slope two limes correspond to second order qubit qubit, uh, qubit uh, uh, interactions around that uh, point. So the outlook will be basically we, as a first batch of device, we next want to improve the uh, device quantity like the qubit coherence time, for example, and want to optimize our modulation schemes. And after that, we'll carry out those uh, uh, unique experiments that uh, wants that wants to use the complicated uh, coupling topologies and other resort another uh, abilities that's embedded in the quantum processor. Last but not least, I acknowledge the whole team and our partners uh, from Lincoln Lab, MIT, and uh, also our industry partners. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, G, could you please uh, um, turn your camera on the, so that you can, we can see you during the oh. question session? Okay, I I'm could have asked that that earlier. <laughs> sorry myself for this. We already have one question. Uh, Kiving, please go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for this very interesting idea. So I, I, I see it's very interesting that you use the uh, two junk, uh, two squeeze to control the boundary condition. 
such that you 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 change the spatial mode. This is an excellent idea, but I'm wondering it only works if you only consider the fundamental mode or, or something, right? But in your 1D resonator, you have multiple modes and this may not work. Can you please comment on this? Uh, the fundamental resonance frequency is around the, around the six megahertz. I experimentally measured to be 600 megahertz. And the modulation frequency is around uh, 50 megahertz, as you can see from the plot. So it's pretty slow. I mean, it's very pretty slow corresponding, I mean, uh, in the, in, for the fundamental mode. And uh, so, I mean, experimentally, of course, you can see the word crossing. So it basically shows that the hybridization happens between parametrically already. Um, so yeah, it's a limitation. You can't uh, exceed half of the fundamental mode of frequency. That's a limitation. So you can't uh, have your qubits to be arbitrarily far apart. The reason is it, so we fabricated qubits uh, in identically, I mean, nominally identically to each other, but uh, we also gave them the tunability. So the qubits are tunable qubits. So you can basically have their detuning to be sufficiently close. So that you don't actually have to be limited by this uh, large uh, two, uh, 300 megahertz say, limitations of your modulation frequency. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we can take one last question by Sandoko. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, it's very interesting architectures. Uh, I wonder whether you can comment on the uh, limitation of co coherence time and what is your current coherence time in your device in this 3D integrated? Uh, yeah, system? that's uh, that's pretty, <laughs> actually, that's, uh, that's why I mentioned that in Outlook we should improve our coherence because uh, the coherence is pretty bad. It's not pretty good, actually. It's a uh, um, single digit microsecond, I mean. Do you know why it's li limiting you in that case? Uh, just curious. Um, it's a limiting factor is that uh, the 3D integrated device always has um, uh, empirically, we haven't done that much, but we had this from nice partners from Lincoln Lab. I see. Uh, they told me that's like uh, the, the, the coherence time empirically should be smaller in the 3D integrated device because you have a more metal air interface. And, uh, and other things that, uh, but uh, we are not actually even at their limit yet. I so see. the uh, the design, uh, because I, I think we're still, we think that the, the possible cost will be uh, probably the the uh, the design for the for the for the squid. Uh, I mean the cubic squid. The cubic tunable cubic, right? Is that the the asymmetric uh, squid? And the asymmetric squid does have uh, magnetic dipoles that's coupled to your sea line. <laughs> so and the way, yeah, that's actually has uh, seems to have larger dipoles than we intended to. So we, we have the next design we will actually minimize, I shrink the, the squeeze size up or shrink the Z line size mm -hmm. a bit. Okay. Were you referring to the T1 or T2 star just now? Uh, sorry. Uh, T2. T2. T1, T1 varies depending on where you park it. So the energy we have to deal with is that mm -hmm. the fridge has this DC, uh, sorry, magnetic flux noise. So uh, for, the, for the flux line. So the currently, if you are away from the intensity point, you get a uh, one microsecond the T1 time basically, but you add the incentive point, you get uh, almost 10 microseconds. Okay, Actually, thank you. It's, that's a very nice idea. Way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, G, and thanks to all the speakers of the session. Uh, it's time now to take uh, a 15 minutes break, and we start again the session in 15 minutes at uh, 4 o'clock at Chalmers time. See you then. So 4 o'clock, welcome everybody again for this uh, um, second part of the afternoon session. We're going to have uh, three talks. Uh, and the first talk is uh, by, by Leonid Abdurakhimov. Did I pronounce correctly your family name? Yes, uh, it was quite good. <laughs> uh, from uh, NTT Basic Research Laboratories. And he will give a talk on long lived 3D uh, C shunt flux qubit and its possible applications. Thank you very much. You can start. Thank you very much. Uh... Hello, everyone. I'm Leonid Abdurahima from NTT Burial, Japan. And my talk will be about a three-dimensional C-shunt flux qubit and its applications. Uh, first, uh, I'll show the design of our qubit uh, and I'll present results of the measurements of relaxation times. Uh, then uh, I'll explain um, uh, how we can use a, a so-called uh, spin-locking pulse sequence to couple our qubit uh, to solid state defects. In the end, uh, I will discuss, I will discuss uh, potential applications of our qubit in bosonic computing. Our qubit uh, consists uh, 
of a C-shunt flux qubit embedded inside a 3D microwave cavity. And the schematic of the qubit is shown at the top right. We have a superconducting loop interrupted by three Josephson junctions. Uh, two junctions are identical. The size uh, of the third junction uh, is reduced by a factor of alpha. In addition, uh, we have a large shunt capacitance in parallel with the small junction. The images of power qubit are shown at the bottom. You can see uh, two large rectangular parts. Uh, they form uh, the shunt capacitance of our qubit, and they are connected um, uh, to the loop uh, with Josephson junctions in the center. Our qubit uh, is quite different from a conventional flux qubit. At the top, uh, I show the full Hamiltonian of a flux qubit with a shunt capacitance in, in the general case. The potential energy of the qubit is determined by the last two terms, and um, uh, the shape of the potential uh, depends on the alpha value. Uh, uh, for a conventional flux qubit, uh, uh, the alpha parameter should be greater than 0 0.5, and um, uh, the potential has two minima. Uh, those two minima correspond to anti-clockwise and, and clockwise persistent currents. The situation is different in our case. In our case, um, alpha parameter is smaller than 0 0.5, and uh, the potential has only one minimum. Um, at the magnetic flux uh, of half the magnetic flux quantum, the Hamiltonian of our qubit um, can be reduced uh, to one dimensional form, and uh, similar to the treatment to the treatment uh, of Transman qubits, uh, uh, we can expand uh, the cosines uh, for small values. And so the Hamiltonian uh, can be written uh, as a harmonic oscillator with uh, a quartic perturbation. Uh, similar to a Transman qubit, uh, we can also write the Hamiltonian uh, in the form of, of the Duffing uh, oscillator. Uh, however, uh, there are some differences uh, between our qubit uh, and Transman qubits. Uh, for example, unharmonic unharmonicity is positive uh, in our case, while for um, conventional Transmans, it's negative. Uh, we studied um, relaxation times of our qubit, and we found that um, relax relaxation times were very long uh, at the optimal flux bias point, of half the magnetic flux quantum. Uh, the energy relaxation time T1 was up to 90 microseconds, and uh, it was limited by quasi-particle tunneling and to level system charge noise. Uh, spin equity T2 was up to 100 microseconds, and uh, T2 Ramsey was uh, up to about 20 microseconds. We also studied uh, the dependence of relaxation times uh, on applied magnetic flux. Uh, the defacing times uh, far from the optimal point we were reduced uh, due to one over f magnetic flux noise, and uh, the pure dephasing rates uh, depended uh, linearly on the detuning value. And details can be found uh, in our APL paper. So uh, we think that uh, our qubit uh, can have a number of potential applications. One possible application is uh, the detection and control of solid state defects. And here, I, uh, by solid state defects, I mean both uh, spin defects, uh, such as NV centers in diamond, and uh, charge defects, uh, such as uh, so-called two-level systems. Uh, two-level systems are mostly formed inside the uh, amorphous oxide layers, and they are um, one of the major noise uh, sources in superconducting circuits. So I'll show how we can use a so-called spin-locking pulse sequence uh, to couple our qubit to solid state defects. And uh, I'll focus uh, on two level system defects uh, as a model system. Uh, first, uh, I would like to provide some background information about uh, TLS spectroscopy techniques. So if you have a flux tunable qubit, uh, such as a phase qubit or a flux qubit, and the coupling strength uh, between uh, the qubit and the level system is large, you can see an avoided crossing in the qubit spectrum. 
Uh, however, if the coupling strength is small, or if you have a fixed frequency qubit such as a transmon, you need to use some other techniques uh, for detection of the level systems. Uh, for example, on the right side, uh, I show the spectrum of our qubit. Uh, there is no visible avoided crossings, but I will show you that even in this case, we could detect two level systems by using a spin locking pulse sequence. Why is it important uh, to know the spectral distribution of the level systems? It was shown that uh, the interaction between the qubit and the near resonant uh, to level system can result in the temporal variations of T1 time. So in any real device, you probably have uh, many two level systems at different frequencies. You probably have two level systems at high frequencies, uh, very close to your qubit. And you also have some two level systems at very low frequencies below the level of thermal fluctuations. Now those two levels are separated in the frequency space, but they can be located very close in the real space uh, so they can interact with each other. And then uh, uh, fluctuations in the configuration of low frequency to level system will result in the frequency fluctuations uh, of high frequency to level system, which in turn can explain uh, the temporal variations of T1 time observed uh, in experiments. Um, I should say that uh, one can use a T1 measurements for a TLS spectroscopy, but the problem with this method is that it can be applied only for tunable qubit or tunable defect. For example, on the top, I show the spectrum of our qubit and a dependence of its T1 time on the applied magnetic flux. You can see pronounced dips at some flux values. And those flux values, the qubit was in resonance with the two level systems. In principle, one can also tune uh, uh, two level systems uh, by using applied mechanical strain or electric field, uh, but uh, such kind of defect spectroscopy uh, requires uh, some uh, special experimental setup. In our approach, uh, we perform defect spectroscopy uh, by using so called spin locking pulse sequence, and this technique. Uh, can be used for any type of qubits or defects. Uh, so we have uh, three pulses in the sequence. Uh, the first pulse uh, rotates the qubit around the white axis by 90 degrees. So the qubit uh, state vector is oriented uh, along the x axis. Uh, the second pulse uh, is applied uh, at, uh, along the same x axis. So uh, the qubit is locked in this direction. And the third pulse uh, rotates the qubit into its final state uh, along the z direction. So its state can be read out by a dispersive readout. In our experiments, we change the duration of the spin locking pulse tau and its amplitude omega r and b frequency. In the spin locking state, um, uh, the uh, direction of qubit uh, state vector is locked but uh, its population uh, decays exponentially with uh, a characteristic time at uh, T1 rho. Uh, it can be shown that uh, the corresponding relaxation rate uh, is determined by low frequency noise uh, at the rho frequency, uh, the gamma omega term, and by the combination of high frequency noises. In some cases, uh, the, gamma, the gamma omega term is dominant, and so it was shown that uh, a spin locking pulse sequence can be used uh, uh, for low frequency noise spectroscopy. But I will show that uh, at certain conditions, uh, uh, the high frequency noise uh, becomes dominant, and so we can use a spin locking pulse sequence uh, for high frequency spectroscopy. In our experiments, we actually used uh, uh, two types of spin locking sequences. Uh, the first uh, uh, sequence was um, uh, the standard spin locking sequence. So uh, the spin locking state was parallel uh, to the x axis. I'll call uh, this state the plus state. Uh, the second sequence, uh, um, in the second sequence, uh, we inverted uh, the phases of pi over two pulses. So uh, the spin locking state was uh, anti parallel uh, to the x axis. I'll, I'll call uh, this state the minus state. 
without the interaction between the qubit and the level system, uh, the evolution of spin locking state is relatively simple. So uh, we have two terms uh, in the Hamiltonian in the laboratory frame, the qubit energy term and the, the qubit drive term. Uh, we can reduce the Hamiltonian by using rotating wave approximation and in the rotating frame, uh, the qubit eigenstates are the plus and minus states and uh, the energy separation between levels is determined by Rabi frequency. Uh, at the bottom, I show results of numerical simulations uh, um, uh, of qubit evolution. Uh, so uh, uh, without the interaction uh, between the qubit and two-level system, um, a sigma x ex expectation values decays to zero for both uh, sequence one and sequence two. We can use a similar approach uh, to calculate uh, spin locking state evolution in the case of the interaction between the qubit and two-level system. So uh, we assume that initially the qubit and uh, two-level system defect are detuned uh, in the laboratory frame. And in the general case, um, we can have defects with um, positive detuning and um, negative detuning. Uh, here, uh, we define the tuning value as the difference uh, between the frequencies of the defect and qubit. In the rotating frame, uh, uh, the separation uh, between uh, the qubit levels uh, is equal to Rb frequency omega r, and uh, uh, the separation uh, between the defect levels is determined by the detuning value. When uh, Rb frequency is equal to the absolute value um, of the detuning, uh, we have a resonant interaction between the qubit and the uh, two-level system in the rotating frame. Numerical simulations show that in this case, um, the effective uh, relaxation time of the qubit becomes much shorter. Uh, the steady state uh, value becomes non-zero and uh, its sign depends on the sign of the detuning. Uh, here I show results um, of spin locking measurements. Uh, so we can see spectral lines uh, at Rb frequencies where um, uh, the spin locking resonance con condition was met. For example, uh, we can see a pronounced feature around 51 megahertz. Uh, in the figure on the right side, uh, I plot uh, experimental data um, at that frequency. Experimental data can be fit uh, by, our, by our numerical model. And uh, that a particular feature corresponded to a positively detuned defect with the coupling strength of 28 kilohertz. By using those, uh, by using those approach, uh, we could uh, uh, identify defects with um, negative and positive detuning as shown in the diagram at the bottom. Uh, details can be found uh, in, in our PRB paper. Uh, so uh, we think we can use uh, a similar technique uh, to couple our qubit to NV centers and diamond. NV centers and diamond uh, have both optical and microwave transitions. So we can use uh, them for microwave at, at optical conversion. Uh, another possible application of our qubit is related to bosonic computing. It can be shown that uh, our Cishan uh, qubit is similar to a snail transmon. And so it, it is possible to suppress uh, um, the fourth order nonlinearity of our qubit by adjusting uh, external flux bias. Uh, so uh, similar to a snail qubit, uh, our qubit can be used uh, as a coupler between bosonic qubits. Uh, here are my conclusions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Leonie. Perfect timing. So then we have uh, quite an extensive time for questions. Um, so are there questions in the, uh, let's see if someone raised the hand. Um, otherwise I can maybe start with a couple of questions. Um, so uh, first, uh, a, a little bit of a detailed question on the last thing that you mentioned. If you can just go back one slide. 
uh, or well, you had the kind of the same conclusion there, but so you mentioned the similarity of your C sharp qubit with uh, uh, a snail device. Um, yes. And uh, so we actually recently gave a proposal where we were using the snail, it's a theory proposal, I'm a theorist. So uh, not only for coupling qubits, uh, or, but uh, rather to engineer continuous variable type of interactions. So for example, uh, um, um, you want to engineer a cubic uh, Hamiltonian uh, for the field. Yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, our qubit uh, is very similar to a snail qubit, so it should be possible uh, to use it uh, in the similar application. So can you select basically the terms of this uh, um, eff eff efficient potential that I see here on the slide? Can you select uh, 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 so yeah, it, it, In the figure uh, uh, here, uh, I show that, uh, uh, for example, uh, we can suppress uh, the fourth order term and, and have uh, only uh, the third order term. I, I think this is uh, the cubic term you are talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot. So let me give the opportunity to the other participants to ask questions. You can just unmute yourself if you have questions. Okay, let, let me ask a question. Uh, so so uh, it seems you can, so in this way you can, you can actually identify individual uh, TLFs uh, and and you could extract if I understand correctly the the frequency and the and the coupling of of an individual TLF. Yes, uh, that's correct. But, so so the coupling, of course, depends both on the on the dipole moment of your TLF and and the 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 distance to it. Is there any way you can extract more information? Uh, by doing additional measurements to find out more about uh, these TLSs? Uh, in our model, it's just coupling st st strength and uh, its, re its relaxation rate. <laughs> so uh, we cannot uh, obtain a any microscopic uh, parameters. But what, what about density then? Uh, you know, how many of those you can find? Uh, density. Mm. So yes, again, uh, in our case, uh, we interpret our data as a, a single TLS with uh, a, a single parameter G. So uh, it's difficult uh, to estimate. But it seems you find uh, yeah. fa fairly few. So I mean, you you have like of the order of ten or so on within yes. the frequency range. So um, you you could give a number for the number per. Uh, gigahertz say oh yes in the frequency space yes yes we can do this mm -hmm. okay thanks thank you and uh, then um, i just would like to ask a very naive question really uh, i just saw maybe yesterday on archive a paper on uh, um, uh, tls versus cosmic rays basically uh, is there anything? So I didn't read the details uh, of the paper, but isn't is there anything in the your spectroscopy technique that would allow you to uh, make maybe correlate uh, the events of TLS uh, with cos mm -hmm. cosmic rays, or like have any conclusions on that, or it's a totally different setup uh, and the experiment? Um, so yes, uh, uh, so uh, the temporal variations of the one time uh, uh, they can be. Uh, explained both by uh, at the level systems and, and also by uh, um, by cosmic rays uh, inducing quasi particle tunneling yeah. and there have been uh, uh, a number of papers uh, in our case uh, at the moment we cannot distinguish between them um, I'm not sure how to do this in, in our case okay. Thank you very much again um, for the nice talk and uh, answers to the questions. Yeah, we you. can now move forward to um, Peter Anthony Spring from the University of Oxford. Peter, you can now share your screen. Great. Can you um, see my slides? Yes. 
Great. Okay, thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Peter. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Oxford in Peter Leake's group. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for this workshop and for giving me the opportunity to speak. So I'd like to talk about um, uh, an architecture that, that we've been developing and then show results on this uh, four qubit proof of principle device that you can see here. So currently the largest superconducting qubit devices feature around um, 50 qubits. And uh, the goal is, I think uh, lots of groups, we'd like to make architectures that are scalable to um, 2D square lattices of nearest neighbor coupled qubits. This is the layout of the surface code, which is this really promising way of doing quantum error correction. So we see tileability as being a useful property in such an architecture. And by that, I mean that your device can contain a unit spell and that has a set of addressable measurable qubits in it. And then you form larger qubit lattices simply by tiling the cell. So this is gonna require some form of um, 3D integrated wiring. And I've just put a selection of, of references to papers that talk about 3D integrated wiring to just say that many groups are working on this and taking um, different approaches. And it's also gonna need some methods of spurious mode suppression, which is something I'm gonna talk more about. So in, in our group, we're pursuing this architecture where you have concentric transmon qubits fabricated on one side of a substrate, and then these spiral um, LC readout resonators that are fabricated on the reverse side of the substrate. And the control wiring is provided by these coaxial cables that come in out of the plane, and they just dangle above the qubit and below the resonator, and they don't galvanically connect to the um, circuit substrate. So the motivators for the architecture are, we're freeing up more real estate on the qubit side of the substrate by removing readout resonators and on-chip wiring. And um, this architecture is kind of inheriting more from a 3D cavity architecture than a 2D planar architecture in that we have no galvanic connections to the substrate, no on-chip wiring, no on-chip ground planes, and often the, the, the highest transmon coherence times have been seen in, in 3D cavity architectures. So this is then a naive unit cell. It contains a single qubit and resonator. The gray boxes are the cavity enclosure. And you can imagine tiling this unit cell to create lattices of, of qubits. And this looks like it might work because the qubits keep their own control wiring and they keep their own readout functionality. Um, however, as you tile this cell, you're just building a bigger and bigger 3D cavity. And so the standing wave modes of that cavity are gonna come down in frequency and cause unwanted effects. So to illustrate that, you can, you can look at the band structure of the infinite lattice formed by tiling the plane with this unit cell. And this is a simulation of the lowest band. Um, and you can see there's a continuum of these modes from, from zero frequency up, up to about 30 gigahertz. And so this is no good because you're, you're guaranteed to have frequency collisions between cavity modes and circuit modes in this case. And this is gonna have um, uh, lots of negative consequences. So here's a slightly modified unit cell. And all we've done is, is run these uh, inductive links through the corners of the cell. Um, equivalently, the, the, both of these cells will form the same lattice when you tile the plane. And, and when, when represented like this, you can see that all we're doing is, is running this, this pillar or, or via um, through the unit cell, which is inductively shunting the enclosure. And then this is now um, the full um, band uh, structure diagram. So the solid line is showing the case where we include this um, shunt and the dashed line is the case where we don't include this shunt. And the thing that jumps out is that this band gap emerges um, and it's below about 34 gigahertz um, where you'll have no cavity modes when you have this inductive shunt. And so qubits are gonna be um, deep within this, this band gap and their interaction with these cavity modes is gonna be suppressed. And the colored lines are showing um, the predictions for the um, band structure around the gamma point from, from some theoretical models. And this is to show that, that models exist for why this band gap appears. So in particular, this red line is, is using a plasma metamaterial model. And this doesn't have any free parameters and it, it, it agrees quite well with the simulated cutoff frequency um, and it gets the curvature right to within an order of magnitude. Um, 
And there are some important consequences for, for this new band structure. So if your qubits are, are within this band, you, you now expect that um, in cavity mediated crosstalk between qubits will decay exponentially with um, spatial separation. Uh, and you can predict the, the decay rate from the shape of this band. And we find that to be about 0.7 millimeters for this design. So this requires us to inductively shunt the enclosure. And the way that we're going about this is with this um, bulk veer concept. So the idea is we're just machining a pillar into the enclosure and then putting this well that you can see in, in the lid. And here in this inset, you can see it filled with indium. Um, and then this schematic shows uh, what this kind of looks like when it's all assembled. So you form this electrical connection through this pillar. And this doesn't require us to metallize the sidewall of the circuit substrate. Um, however, it, it does require us to put an aperture through the circuit substrate. Um, and we've done this with this um, uh, CNC machining. So this allows us to make high aspect ratio um, apertures that have quite a large diameter. And, and this could be quite hard to do with a wet etching process. And, and this can also be performed after circuit fabrication and alongside wafer dicing. So that was kind of motivation for the architecture and, and this unit cell. And we'd like to demonstrate a, a really small scale. So here you can see a proof of principle four qubit device. Um, you can see a single inductive shunt in the center. Uh, the readout resonators are not visible in this picture because they're on the reverse side of the substrate, but you can see an image of one of our spiral resonators here in the corner. Um, and so the qubits are uncoupled in this device. We want to keep um, it really simple. We're first of all, just interested in, can we get good coherence times in this architecture? And um, let's look at like the best case kind of crosstalk um, before we introduce the coupling circuitry. And then I'd like to stress that the central region of this device has exactly the same dimensions as that unit cell um, whose band structure we were just simulating. So now I'll talk about how we're implementing the off-chip control wiring. So here you can see the sealed up enclosure in the bottom left. And then this wiring piece is um, coming down and slotting into this enclosure. And you can see in this blow up image, these are the inner conductors of um, four coaxial cables that are protruding out and they're going to slot into these holes that are just visible in the enclosure. And when it's put together, this is a schematic of how this looks. So you have this coaxial cable uh, and then the inner conductor protrudes in, into this hole in the enclosure and it forms an effective coaxial waveguide uh, with the enclosure. And then that inner conductor terminates and then you have a distance DI and then um, your qubit or resonator. And so the qubit or resonator is then coupled to the control wiring through this um, cylindrical waveguide. And we've designed the dimensions such that we're impedance matched at the transition from the coaxial cable to the effective coax waveguide to minimize reflections. Um, we've chosen this, this distance um, called D2 in this figure to be quite large so that the circuits are, are well separated from any PTFE inside the coaxial cables. And then um, we know the dominant mode of this cylindrical waveguide. Uh, and so for these dimensions, we, we can predict the um, the decay rate for this mode it, because it's evanescent and we find that to be about 150 micrometers so that kind of sets our sensitivity to, to misalignment um, of, of this inner conductor all right so now i'll move on to the device characterization so you can see a picture of the fully assembled device here um, the basic kind of results are qubits are around four gigahertz and resonators are around eight gigahertz um, the qubits are well into the transmon regime with EJ over EC greater than 65, and the qubit resonator couplings are around 120 megahertz. So next I'll talk about the um, coherence metrology. So to measure T1, we did 251 repeated T1 experiments on the four qubits over about 12 hours. Um, and you can see the, the histograms that result from, from those measurements on the left. Um, and then you can see an example T1 uh, Ramsey time trace and Han echo time trace on, on qubit one. And we also did ensembles of those measurements. Uh, and the main result here is that the coherence times are quite good for transmon qubits. So we have average T1s of um, 150 microseconds and then average purity phasing times of 190 microseconds with respect to these um, echoes. So next I'll talk about the um, 
control line crosstalk. So we're interested in, in how selective this, this off-chip wiring design can be. So we can ask, how well can I resonantly drive all of the different qubits from the different qubit control lines? Um, and you can run those experiments and for all permutations and build up this selectivity table. And we find that the average qubit control line selectivity is about 56 dB. And then similarly, um, you can do uh, this experiment uh, for, for the readout resonators. And now you're asking how well can I populate all of these different resonators from the different resonator control ports? And here we find a selectivity of about 42 dB. So we've also looked at other crosstalk quantities. Um, so for instance, here we're asking, uh, what's the parasitic coupling between qubits and neighboring resonators? And we were unable to directly measure this, but we could at least put an experimental bound on it. Um, so we're kind of trying to measure induced AC Stark shifts in qubits while populating neighboring resonators. And, and you can see um, that on this graph. So here we're tracking the frequency of qubit one um, using Ramsey um, experiments. And so in the first five measurements, we're, we're applying no drive to any resonator. And in the, in the next five measurements, um, we're applying a, a continuous drive to resonator two to populate it with approximately its critical photon number. And then so on for resonator three and resonator four. Um, and so we're able to put a bound on, on any AC Stark shifts that are occurring. And then from that, we can bound um, parasitic single photon Stark shifts. So here we bound those to about three Hertz. And then from that, you can uh, immediately follow a bound on the parasitic coupling G. And so we, we run this again for all permutations of qubits and resonators. And we bound our, our parasitic Gs to, to less than 0.4% of, of our deliberate um, qubit resonator couplings. So um, we looked at uh, single qubit gate fidelities as well in this device using randomized benchmarking. Um, we performed that both simultaneously and, and separately on the four qubits. And the main results are that the, the single qubit gate fidelities are around 99.98%. And this is with respect to the, to the physical gates, not to the Clifford gates. Um, and the coherence limit in this device is, is around 4.9. So, so we're quite close to that coherence limit. Um, and importantly, we find that the average gate fidelity is the same when we run this separately and simultaneously to within error. And that's evidence that the crosstalk is quite low in this architecture. Um, we also did leakage randomized benchmarking on qubit three, which had the best uh, readout fidelity. And here we find uh, a leakage of about 3.6 times 10 to the minus five, which is um, significantly less than the, than the physical errors. So the data in those randomized benchmarking experiments was taken using single shot readout. Um, so we can also look for correlators in, in, the, in the simultaneously performed randomized benchmarking. Uh, and you can see that on, on this graph here. So I'll, I'll try and explain this a bit. The blue um, points, those are showing uh, expectations of products and um, products of expectations for um, measurements along Z between qubit one and two. And you can fit both of those curves to a standard exponential decay curve. And then um, from the difference in the depolarizing parameters, th this will kind of flag up any correlated errors. And so then you can do this for all different permutations of, of qubits. So the, the green curves, these are showing three qubit correlators between qubit one, two, and three. Uh, and the red curves are showing um, a full four qubit correlator between all, all of the qubits here. And yeah, the main uh, message is that we don't see clear signatures of, of significant correlated error, uh, which is consistent with the fact that the fidelities come out to be roughly the same when we run this separately and simultaneously. So in conclusion, we've measured um, high coherence times and single qubit gate fidelities in a 3D integrated architecture and kind of shown that the device contains a unit cell and we predict a cutoff frequency for cavity modes when we tile this cell. Um, so we think this is a promising architecture for building 2D lattices of qubits. And to that end, you can see um, an enclosure here for a 16 qubit device that we're um, going to move on to next. So um, with that, um, thank everyone in the Leak Lab group and thank our collaborators uh, at the University of Southampton and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Let's see if um, 
there are questions for you in the chat, yes. Uh, so please, Sandoko, you can ask your question. Hi, Peter. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. This is Sandoko. So very impressive work. Uh, I was looking at this uh, T1 and T2, uh, oh no, the T1 measurements. Uh, can you comment whether uh, the improvement in T1, is it due to the fact that you have this inductive shunt in your KPT or is it due to the fabrication process? And I'm wondering whether how, how has, I mean, compare, I mean, if you compare your, if you have a cavity box without inductive shunt and with inductive shunt, how much have they improved? Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, unfortunately, my answer will have to be a little bit speculative. Um, so we've changed multiple things with this experiment. So as well as putting in this shunt, we've also completely changed our fabrication recipe mm -hmm. compared to previous devices. Um, so I, I don't think that the shunt is, is actually helping coherence um, at this scale. So if we didn't have this inductive shunt in this enclosure, the cavity modes would still be um, pretty high in frequency. So I think that the, the, the benefit of that shunt would only start to become clear in larger enclosures. So I think these coherence times are mostly a result of um, yeah, changing the fabrication recipe completely, um, mm. changing the qubit geometry to really try and minimize um, participation in interfaces. And also we're benefiting a bit from the fact that the qubit frequencies are quite low here. They're about four gigahertz. So we're a bit less sensitive to um, dielectric losses. I see. So uh, have you, um... uh, no, it's okay, it's fine. Thank you. This is very nice work. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks. Sandako, if you, if you want, I mean, if you have more questions uh, for the moment, uh, I mean, we are two minutes ahead of time. So if you want to ask, uh, more precise. I had a question, but the question disappeared suddenly, so I couldn't really think of the question right now. Give me some time. <laughs> okay. You can also contact uh, Peter afterwards uh, in the chat uh, yes. privately, directly, as direct message. Otherwise, I would like to... Uh, so let me just wait 30 seconds extra. Are there more questions for Peter? Uh, so, so thanks for this very nice talk. I, I have a very technical question, two, two questions. So first, I, I remember you said you treat the, the, the silicon chip on both sides. So do you use some very special silicon chips, very special wafers or just common? Um, yeah, so we're using just double side polished um, silicon wafers. I believe we use three inch wafers um, in this experiment, but no, it's not, it's not particularly special. It's just, it's very important that they're double side polished. Okay, and my second question is that I, I see your transmission lines are kind of um, um, the, the lid is hanging vertically, so the mechanical um, vibration of the lines will not influence the result or it also matters. That's a really, really good question. Um, so yes, uh, if there is my mechanical vibration in the line, that could be a, um, a, a dephasing mechanism because exactly you're going to change the, the kind of um, the, the loaded uh, quality factor of, of your qubits and resonators. Um, so we are interested in that, if that could be um, a dephasing mechanism limitation. At the moment, we think that our Ramsey times are limited by um, population, uh, so thermal populations in our resonators, but that is something that we need to, to bear in mind. Okay, thank you, it's very impressive. Thanks. Uh, Peter, there is uh, two other questions. One from uh, Giovanna Tancredi, who says, uh, very nice work. What about the T1 in devices with coupled qubits? Yeah, um, so in this, uh, with this new fabrication recipe, we don't really have devices yet that have coupled qubits. Um, so I can't comment on, on, on that too much. Obviously, we do need to introduce couplers to this architecture. Um, we know that. Um, so I, I don't think that introducing couplers, um, depending on the type that you use, is likely to affect the coherence times of these qubits um, too much, though. OK, thanks. And uh, there is a last question from Chris. Uh, Giovanna says thank you, by the way. So Chris, please, you can ask the last question to Peter. Uh, yeah, just a follow up on this uh, mechanical vibration question that was asked uh, previously, how long have you measured your T1 over or T2 over total? Because I'm just wondering if you can just measure uh, down to the limit where you can be sensitive to the pulse tube fluctuations. Right. Um, so we've measured um, T1s over 
So is, is this individual time trace measurements or kind of repeated measurements? Uh, I guess repeated measurements to see if you can see uh, large scale noise or see some spike around the frequency of the pulse tube. Yeah, right. So we've measured T1s over kind of these 12 hour windows and we've done that a few times. Um, and the results come out uh, pretty consistent each time we do that. Um, with T2, we did see some windows of like an, it was quite strange, like an hour or two where one of the qubits T2 would like just dramatically drop out and then it would come back and be absolutely fine for, you know, 20 hours or so. Um, so that's kind of the one funny thing that we've seen with, with T2 in this device. But you haven't taken like a PSD or anything to see uh, where your noise presses are? Okay. No, no, that's probably something we should do. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, thanks again. Uh, thank and uh, it's now the time for the last uh, talk of the session, who is going to be given by uh, Xin Yuan Yu from Northwestern University. So Xin Yuan, you can go ahead and share your screen. Maybe Peter needs to uh, unshare the screen first. Perfect. Um, yes. Great. Great. You can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Just a minute. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Xin Yuan Yu, um, working with uh, Professor Yin Scott from uh, Northwestern University. And today I would like to uh, share with you our recent uh, idea of realizing a protected superconnecting circuit that is derived from the Flexonia molecule. So I will focus on the theory part of this work. And uh, currently we are also in, collabor in collaboration with uh, Professor uh, Andrew Hauck from Princeton to fabricate a circuit. So before I start, I would like to uh, thank the organizer for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, present our work here. So I'll start with some uh, introduction. So uh, the superconducting circuit is a solid state device, which means it will have a lot of interactions with uncontrollable degrees of freedom in the environment. So for example, here you see a, uh, a three Josephson junction flux qubit that are sitting on a substrate. And also uh, here shows some uh, common noise channels. For example, we see uh, the total magnetic flux through a loop can fluctuate and causing uh, the so-called flux noise. And we also uh, have uh, charge noise here is due to those tunneling two level systems that are uh, sitting in a substrate or inside a tunnel barrier. And for those two level systems here, they can also uh, cause critical current noise. And we have like quasi particles tunnel through the junction and uh, contributing to the decoherence of the qubit. So although there are many uh, noise channels, but we see that over the past two decades, uh, the lifetime of superconducting qubit has been uh, improved like more than uh, five order orders of magnitudes. Those circles here denotes uh, those Josephson junction based qubit. And we see recently there are more and more interest in those uh, bosonic encoded qubit, which uh, we see uh, many uh, uh, great talks from yesterday. But in this talk, I will uh, still focus on the Josephson junction based qubit. And the goal is uh, essentially to extend the so called quantum Moore's law and to achieve a uh, higher coherence qubit. So to reach this goal, um, we need to have a qubit that is protected uh, simultaneously against uh, depolarization and also dephasing noise. The depolarization noise can be characterized by Fermi's golden rule, where uh, it's, uh, the depolarization rate is proportional to this matrix element, uh, where zero one is your qubit logical state and O is the is the noise is the qubit operator that couples to the noise. So if the wave functions of the two logical states live in different parts of the Hubel space, or we call that they have this joint support, then you would, uh, you would expect this matrix element would be exponentially small and therefore uh, gives you a relatively long T1. And for dephasing noise, uh, it is characterized by the sensitivity of the energy level with respect to the noise parameter. So here denoted by uh, lambda. Ideally, we would like to have those energies with exponentially small dependence on the noise parameter, but this usually poses strict requirements on uh, circuit parameters and are sometimes challenging to realize in the experiment. So one step back here is to operate a circuit at the so-called uh, sweet spot, where the energy difference uh, reaches uh, extrema and give you a first order insensitivity to the dephasing noise. 
So for most of the circuit, uh, they can either have a long T1 or they can have a great uh, T5 period phasing time. But in general, it would be hard to uh, realize both at the same time in a, uh, in a single degree of freedom qubits. So a, an example here is the, is the Fluxonian qubit, essentially an uh, inductively shunted Joseph's injunction. So the circuit forms a loop, uh, therefore can be penetrated by external flux and therefore subjecting to uh, uh, flux noise. So here I'm showing you uh, the, the energy of the lowest two eigenstates as a function of the external flux. So we see if we uh, bias the circuit at this so-called uh, half flux quantum, the flux sweet spot, then we would have a first order insensitivity to uh, the flux dephasing noise, and therefore uh, we will have a relatively long pure dephasing time T5. However, if we <clears throat> look at the wave functions, uh, uh, the, wa the, the wave functions of the teleological states are essentially a superposition and uh, entire superposition of two uh, localized states in a double well potential. Therefore, this significant matrix element would cause a uh, relatively short T1. <clears throat> On the other hand, if we uh, bias the circuit away from a sweet spot, then we will have a long T1, because now you see the wave functions uh, are localizing each well, and therefore they have this kind of disjoint support. Um, but for T5, it will be relatively short, because now we are away from the sweet spot. So the, uh, the energy levels will be very sensitive to the fluctuation in the external flux. So this trade-off, uh, which mainly due to the restriction that we only have a single degree of freedom circuit, could be overcome uh, if we have larger circuits with multiple degrees of freedom. So a promising candidate here is the so-called zero pi qubit, uh, which was first proposed by Brooks, Kitaev, and Prisco, and more recently realizing uh, Andrew Hawke's lab. So the zero pi qubit uh, consists of a, uh, a squid loop with two explicit superinductors and there are two additional shunt capacitors. So this is a, a four node uh, circuit, meaning that you will have like four normal modes. And besides one being cyclic, the other three can be represented by uh, the zeta of phi and the zeta variables. So graphically, we can uh, represent those normal modes by assigning voltage drop to different circuit elements. So for example, in the, in the zeta mode, you see only the, uh, the junction and the capacitor are active. So this actually resembles a transmom. So we call it a transmog-like mode. And for the fine mode, um, uh, the inductor and junction are involved. So <clears throat> this resembles a fluxonian. And finally, for the zeta mode, uh, th there is only voltage drop across the linear inductor and capacitor. So this is simply an LC oscillator. And, and we call that a cavity-like mode. And we know end of perfect circuit symmetries, which means uh, if, the two junction, uh, if the two capacitors and two uh, inductors are identical, then the zeta mode will be fully decoupled from the rest of the two modes. And then we can encode quantum information into the zeta and phi direction. So it costs to have larger circuit is of course, now you will be, uh, you will have more noise channels, but uh, fortunately we can using the strategies that has been developed with a corresponding single degree of freedom circuit to reduce those sensitivities. So for example, the zeta mode here, like uh, the transmog, which is subjecting to charge noise, but we can utilize those uh, large shunt capacitor to exponentially suppress the sensitivity. And for the, for the fine mode, uh, uh, it forms a loop, therefore it couples to, uh, to flux noise, but we can still operate a circuit at those uh, uh, three spots and therefore get, get a first order insensitivity. What more remarkable is that the circuit is also insensitive to depolarization noise. So here plotted are the, are the, are the, log, are the wave functions of the two logical states. So you can see for your logical zero state, it is localized in this theta equal to zero well. And for uh, this one state, it is localized in this pi well. And this disjoint support nature would uh, indicate a long T1. And indeed, this is what has been uh, observed in the experiment at 1.6 milliseconds T1. Um, but the T2 is not as great. Uh, and we understand that because in practice, it is almost impossible to have perfect circuit symmetries and as a result, the zeta mode will be inevitably coupling to the rest of the two modes. And due to the fact we want to operate a circuit to be uh, insensitive to charge noise and also to have this discrete support nature, they require us to have a very large uh, shunt capacitor and also a large superinductor. And they in turn would cause uh, this uh, zeta mode to have a, a very small uh, harmonic mode energy. And we know at a finite temperature, there will be a thermal population in this mode. And <clears throat> And any number of uh, fluctuation uh, would, would cause the so-called photon shot noise and ultimately limits the uh, coherence time of the qubit. 
So is there a way to uh, increase this, uh, the energy of the zeta mode? So our idea here is to convert a transmog-like mode to another flexonia-like mode. And the reason why the zero pi uh, couple to charge noise is because the circuit has two isolated circuit islands, which are dedicated here uh, by different colors. So imagine that if we now use an additional uh, inductor to connect those two islands, then the circuit would only have a single island. And as a result, it will not be uh, coupling to the DC offset charge noise. And those large shunt capacitor is no longer required. And we can have a, a large zeta mode energy and a suppressed photon shot, photon shot noise. So another benefit to have this uh, in, uh, inductor here is that the circuit would, uh, you don't need to charge by the circuit when operating that, which is a uh, more convenient compared to a zero pi qubit. So it should be mentioned that we are not the first one to come up with the circuit. It has been introduced before, uh, knowing as a flexonium molecule or more recently the kite flexonium. But uh, the goal in those uh, works are very different. Uh, they're either focusing on, for example, like studying the common differential mode or <clears throat> a uh, magnified quantum phase fluctuation. But our goal here is uh, really to realize a protected qubit. So now we see the circuit should be uh, insensitive to photon shot noise. But then the question is, will it, will it also be insensitive to other dephasing noise? And also, uh, will this disjoint support nature survive? To see that, we uh, carefully quantize the circuit. Um, so although we don't need those large shunt capacitor, uh, we do keep one very small uh, parasitic capacitance here just to make the derivation simpler. So the circuit forms a two loop, which is different than zero pi, each of which can be penetrated by external flux here denoted by uh, phi u1 and phi u2 here. So still, this is a uh, four node circuit. Therefore, we adopt uh, the notation from zero pi uh, with one main difference is that the theta variable here becomes an extended variable uh, unlike zero pi, which is a periodic one. So the full circuit Hamiltonian is shown here. For the phi in the theta direction, it is described to uh, coupled harmonic oscillators via this uh, junction term. And on zeta mode, as we mentioned, it is a uh, high energy harmonic mode, which here couples to the theta variable uh, from this interaction term. So phi c and phi d here denotes uh, basically the, the common and differential flux of uh, those two external flux here. So the things the zeta mode is higher lying, therefore we can approximate the total Hamiltonian within its low uh, energy subspace where there is no harmonic excitation. And this can be realized, for example, by performing a uh, shriekel wolf transformation. And here is the reduced Hamiltonian. The potential energy landscape here is um, a, a sum of a double cosine potential plus a uh, parabolic uh, potential. And the regime that we are interested in is that we want to have those uh, multiple wells um, and this simply requires uh, the two inductive energy to be much smaller than the junction energy. And we also want the states to be uh, localized in each of the well. And this uh, requires the, uh, the kinetic energy to be smaller than the barrier. So here is the charging energy uh, smaller than this junction energy. So to see, <clears throat> to, to investigate the sensitivity of the circuit to flux noise, here I'm showing you the, uh, the eigenenergy of the lowest four states as a function of the common and differential flux. So the first thing we notice is that there are three inversion symmetry points that are marked by uh, A, B, and C. So this, uh, this simply re uh, reflects the invariance of the Hamiltonian with respect to uh, the change to the external flux. But more importantly, there are also double flux V spot, which means the energy would reach its extrema along any direction across those inversion symmetry points. So for example, here I'm uh, showing you a line cut along the paths connecting those uh, high symmetry points and those extreme that I'm talking about are highlighted here. So the, the idea of this uh, slide is that uh, if we operate a circuit at those inversion symmetry points, then we would be insensitive uh, to both the common and differential flux uh, noise, uh, at least uh, uh, on first order. And notice that this is the dominant dephasing noise here because we don't have charge noise. Then how about depolarization? Uh, well, here I'm showing you the, uh, the wave functions of the lower four eigenstates in this inversion symmetry point A, and lower is the, is the potential energy landscape. So we, we can see that the lower two states forms a doublet across the, the theta direction, and for the higher two states, they form another doublet across the perpendicular phi direction. And therefore, if we choose our logical state to be uh, theta plus and phi minus, then we would essentially achieve this string support because uh, the wave functions uh, live in perpendicular wells. And for the other two inversion symmetry points, we can also choose wave functions uh, that uh, 
display the string support. And the structure of those wave functions can be uh, best understand by uh, looking at uh, the origin of the paraboloid potential with, uh, in this double cosine potential. So in the previous two slides, I've shown qualitatively, qualitatively why the circuit should have a, a good T1 and a good T5. And here, let me show you some estimation. So for depolarization noise, we mainly considering uh, the dielectric loss, inductive loss, and the, the quasi-particle loss. And a T1 is estimated using this Fermi's golden rule, where S of omega is your uh, noise spectral density. And here we also include uh, the contribution that uh, the, the T1 contribution that is coming from leakage outside of the computational subspace. So here's a T1 uh, from different noise source. And for the particular parameters that they were choosing here, it is limited by the inductive loss. And here's a T1 contribution from different energy levels. So we can see within a computational subspace, uh, which is the zero and two state, we can see the T1 with above like 10 milliseconds. So this uh, directly reflects the power of the disjoint support. But we see the overall T1 would be still limited by this leakage outside of the computational subspace. And for the phasing noise, we uh, as usual consider flux noise, but both for the common and differential mode, and also uh, the critical current noise. And due to the fact that we operate a circuit at those three spot, we need to consider the second order contribution uh, to the dephasing noise. And here is a uh, here is a sketch where we find mainly it is limited by common flux noise here. So the overall T1, T2 for the uh, for the three uh, inverted symmetry points are shown here. And they're uh, calculated using uh, the parameters here, which are basic, uh, which are all experimentally feasible. And the noise parameter that we're choosing are extracted from this cosine two five paper uh, from front of every group. So to conclude, um, I've shown you a uh, protective super connecting qubit that is based on a flexionary molecule, which shows uh, the string support and also a double flux sweet spot. Compared to zero pi, the qubit. Uh, needs no charge biasing, and there is no photon shot noise defacing. So in the future, we would like to further suppress uh, those leakage and also uh, collaborating with uh, experimentalists to uh, realize the circuit, which is really done by uh, Densi Crude and Anjali Perkuma in Andrew Hawks lab. And thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Sir. So let's open the session for questions. We have a first question by Jielu. Please, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you. A great talk. And um, can I ask, like, uh, did you estimate the influence of uh, uh, experimental imperfections between uh, that's cost asymmetries between elements like the junctions and uh, the inductance, the pair of inductance in your system? So, sorry, are you asking the, the effect of disorder? Yeah, did you actually estimate the effect of disorder? In your fabricated mm -hmm. elements? Right, good question. Um, so let me go to this slide. So we know disorder would play an important role in zero pi because uh, only when you have a perfect symmetry, the zeta mode would be decoupled from the rest of the two modes. But um, in a case of this, uh, the, the, this new circuit, um, we see, <clears throat> um, right, so you, you can see that the zeta mode is already coupled to uh, this this uh, this zeta mode by this interaction term, even there is no disorder. So and and we also uh, we also calculate the effect of disorder, and uh, it does not change quantit uh, qualitatively the the behavior of the circuit, only quantitatively. Um, can I ask uh, what uh, level of disorder did you put in your model? Ten percent or? Um. So I, I, I think the disorder that we take is like from zero to one, and uh, the the uh, the disorder I'm cons I mean I mean the range is from zero to one, and the disorder I'm considering is like uh, I think 0. 0.5, uh, sorry 0. 0.05 something like that. Five percent. Uh, right. Yeah. So Roughly. okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we have another question from the chat uh, from Valentino Seferai. Valentino is asking. Uh, what does the soft in the soft zero pi qubit represent? Are the zero pi qubit and soft zero pi qubits different in any regard? Right. Um, so for the for, for the zero pi on original proposed zero pi qubit, um, uh, you will have like a you will have a degeneracy of the of the two logical states, and essentially 
uh, you, that would help you achieve an exponential uh, suppression of the flux noise. But, he, but that would require a very large superinductor, which is uh, challenging to realize in the experiment. So uh, here, the soft zero pi is basically the inductor is, is not that, the superinductor is not that large, uh, which only can provide you a first order protection uh, of, the, of the flux noise. So that's the, that's the main difference of the soft zero pi and uh, the, the deep zero pi regime. OK, thank you very much. Uh, let's have a last call. Are there more questions? Valentino says uh, thank you, by the way. Um, last chance to ask a question. If there are no more questions, I would like to thank you again for the nice talk and thanks all the participants of this session. Uh, we now close the afternoon session and we are going to take a one hour break and we reconvey all together at uh, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, Chalmers time. Uh, yeah, so I wish you a pleasant and uh, relaxing break. See you later. <laughs>